Hello, good evening everybody and welcome to The Dentist Show. It's Thursday night and it's date night with Denta and it's another exciting you know, topic and episode, should I say, that we're going to be discussing um, this evening. Um, as you know, last week we discussed uh, societal pressures that men face, okay? We did the women, then we did the men to see what the men face um, as well. Do men get the same pressures as women to get married, to have children? And um, a lot of the men felt that they get pressures as well. Um, but I think it's still the women that get most of the pressures, to be honest. Um, hello, Josephine. Thank you so much for coming on. Hello, Jacob. Please make sure that if you are watching, you are sharing your pages to a loved one on Facebook, do a watch party, because it's really important that as we are discussing these topics, that we are getting the community to listen to these amazing topics, topics that really affect our community. And, you know, today we're talking about find out why funeral travel and health insurance and having a will is essential. Um, you know, especially during COVID-19, I'm sure a lot of people have lost loved ones unexpectedly and they don't have life insurance. They don't have a will. Nothing is done. And they're just like, oh, my gosh, I wish I had done a life insurance. I wish I had had a will for my family. Um, and so today we're going to be talking to Jacqueline, Emma, Sheila. Jacqueline, I know very well. We met a few years ago in the UK from enterprise insurance she's one of the directors an amazing woman powerful amazing woman um and you know guba has had the chance to work with them and myself um so we're gonna she's gonna be joining us very very shortly as well as emma from old mutual and sheila as well who's an amazing lawyer been in the industry for over 30 years um, and going to be sharing her experience about the importance of wills that we should not be joking with wills at all it's so important, it's so vital. Um, but as you know, I need to do a little bit of my adverts and people that are supporting this amazing um, dental show live. If it wasn't for you, this show would not be, be possible. So again, I must say a big thank you to World Remit, who are our main sponsors for this show. Join 5.7 million customers worldwide using World Remit to send money to your family and friends back home in Ghana. It's fast, it's easy, and guess what? They get their money in minutes. You can use your laptop, you can use your phone, at any, at any convenience for you, and it's available 24 hours. No fees for your first three transfers. So make sure that you use World Remit. It's the better way to send money. Yes, it is. So make sure that, you know, you go out there, you download the app and use World Remit. And again, I must say a big thank you to Seek. Seek VR is an amazing um, um, headphones by a Ghanaian. Yes, she's Ghanaian. She's doing amazing things. She's actually a Goober Award winner. Um, she's got these amazing headphones. It's called Seek VR. Go online and guess what? If you enter the promo code Denta VIP, you get 10% off. Yes, 10% off of all of her products that she has. And um, so I would go on the website and grab one. Um, and again, again, we've got this amazing Ghanaians that are doing amazing things. So this is by um, Sabrina. Um, she's actually one of the Goober team members and she's doing these balloons for your birthdays, you know, for christenings, really nicely designed. Um, you can go on her website. She does events as well. She does all of these decors. Um, and it's really important that we start supporting our own. So make sure that you go on the website, you go on her social media and, um, you know, buy one, you know, get her services and support young people who are doing amazing things. I think it's really important that these days we support each other as much as possible. Black Lives Matter, as we know. Um, and again, Prodigy, Cassie's Classics. She does amazing all-purpose seasoning, shitter, jollof seasoning. Again, go online and grab one, support the cause. This is a, another young Ghanaian that's based in Atlanta. That During COVID-19, she decided to do something and it tastes so good. I love the jollof seasoning. For those that love um, jollof as well, and her shito is number one. So make sure that you go online and you know grab one. 
Um, and Odana Connect, for all of you that are looking to do things in Africa, um, especially Ghana, if you're looking for job opportunities, if you're looking for partnerships, if you're looking to go into agriculture, whatever it is that you are looking to do in Africa, it's a one-stop shop. If you're looking for land, whatever, go to Odana Connect and make sure that you register with them. So I think I now, I know that everybody's eager for the topic. Um, and I'm going to start introducing my guests who are also waiting um, for us to connect. So I'll start off with Emma. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Emma. Right. She's from Old Mutual. So Emma um, is the head of corporate business at Old Mutual Life Insurance. Proact she's a proactive professional with 12 years of experience of working in banking and finance, banking and insurance. Her focus within the industry has been new business development, client relationship um, management. Um, and she is prior to joining Old Mutual in 2015. Um, Emma worked with Metropolitan Life Insurance, Merchant Bank, Barclays. Um, she holds a MBA in finance management a BSc in chemistry um, from University of Cape Coast. She's an amazing woman and I'm gonna bring her on the screen right away. Um, and then I'm gonna introduce my next guest. Okay, hello, Emma. I'll just say a quick hello and I'm gonna introduce everybody on here. Okay. Alrighty, so we have Jacqueline. Um, Jacqueline is the managing director for um, Enterprise Life. Um, she is a believer that life being about creating yourself and not finding yourself. Wow. So life is about creating yourself and not finding yourself. She's God-fearing, ambitious, um, a trans transformational leader. I definitely agree with that. Um, so she's the managing director of Enterprise Life since 2016. Um, she's worked in various units of the business, um, being one of the very first employees of Enter Enterprise Life in Ghana. Um, she, her most notable footsteps are setting up Enterprise Life's first batch in Tema, leading the team, set up the customer service, quality assurance, corporate business and sales operations, department her passion for business excellence um is phenomenal i definitely agree with that um and she has over 16 years um 17 years in various leadership um positions so please welcome jacqueline hi jackie hi hello <laughs> yay <laughs> Jackie, how are you? I'm good, blessed and favored. Good, good, good. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you. Good to see you too. Hi, Emma. It's been a, it's been a while. Since I, made the last, I think the last time um, I saw you, we were we had breakfast, right? We had breakfast yes. at um, yes. uh, this. Hotel in Ghana, I can't remember the name. It was you and Jerry and myself. Yes. Um, uh, Do you remember? Oh, yes, I, I missed it. I'm sure it will come along the way, but I, I just missed it. I've, but I remember, um, <laughs> oh, just around the airport area. <laughs> yes, it's, it's gone. Don't worry, don't worry. It'll come back, it'll come back. Let me introduce Sheila onto the show as well. Um, so please welcome Sheila. She is the managing um, consultant at Apex Law Consult, a law firm in Accra. Um, she's also the chairperson for the Ghana Bar Association's Women and Minor Rights Committee. Um, she holds a degree in law from the University of Ghana, Legon. Um, she has over 30 years of experience and it's an honor to have her on the show today. So please welcome Sheila. Hi, Hi. Sheila. Hi. Good Hi evening. To everyone. Mm. Hi. 
So happy to be here. <laughs> okay. Thank you all once again for joining me on the show. I think, I think we'll just get cracking. I think these, you know, when I first thought about doing this topic, it was um, a conversation that I had with my dad a few years ago. And I was like, Dad, have you done your will? And my dad was like, hey, I don't why. I don't know why are you asking me this question? And I was like, no, it's not that. I'm just making sure that, you know, you have done your will and everything is, you know. And it's something that I feel like in our community, we don't like to discuss. Um, even putting out this, um, the promotion, I got a, a lot of messages that people say, look, they try to speak to their parents about it. And it's, it's like they don't want to talk about it. And I think that it stops a lot of, you know, family disputes. Um, and the reason why I had asked my dad is that at my workplace, um, as a pediatric nurse, I was at work and I was talking to one of the um, Jamaican nurses. And she said to me, Denta, make sure that you save for your kids, you do insurance for yourself and your children, and also you actually pay for your funeral, like your, your, your funeral and everything should be paid for. None of your children should be hustling to get money to pay for your food. So she's paid for her coffin. She's paid for her graveyard. Like she's paid for everything. She does not want her children to go through anything like that. Um, and I was amazed. And so I went home and I was like, dad, you know, have you done this? And I was like, hey, why are you, why are you asking me this question? <laughs> you know? Um, and so I really wanted to have this topic um, so that we can really dive into the importance of insurance and wills. And, and I'll start off with Sheila. Um, Sheila, I know I spoke, I spoke a little bit about yourself, but please tell us a little bit more about your, your law firm and the types of law that you focus on. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, Apex Law Consult was set up in 1992. Originally, it was set up by um, a very senior lady lawyer who eventually went to the Supreme Court. So I took over from her in 1995. I worked with her okay. from when she set it up. And then I took over from her in 1995. And I've run it till now. And basically, we focus on, we do a lot of work on family law. So we help with wills, estates, you know, you know, divorce cases, etc. We also do land securitization. You know, people who have land who want to register their interests, we help with that. Then we also do some corporate work as well. We do a few corporate clientele that we represent, do contracts, etc. In Ghana, it's difficult to over-specialize. Otherwise, you're going to go hungry. But these are the three areas in which we work in. And um, yeah, so I've been doing this for, for, for quite a while. And you know, when, when I gave you my little bio indicated, I mentioned the Women and Minus Rights Committee of the Ghana Bar Association. So basically, this is a committee made up of both men and women. But our focus is to try to reach out to both women and men and children and encourage them to know about their rights. So it's things like making wills. We go around to churches, etc., to let people know about the need and the importance of making wills. You mentioned that your dad was a reluctant. You know, in Ghana, many people are reluctant because traditionally, we had a certain way in which people sort of left instructions when they died. And normally it was made in contemplation of death. They called it, among the trees, tree people, they call it Samansho, and the guns call it Samansho. And usually a person makes it just when they're about to die, okay? But there are all kinds of issues relating to it. A few of them have gone to court and, you know, it's been said if the, you don't die, then it doesn't apply. I mean, if you if you, you continue living, et cetera, et cetera. So that was traditional oral ways of sort of um, making provision for your property when you die. But we've had um, a law in place since 1971 guiding how wills are made. And even before 1971, some of the British rules applied here. But since 71, we have a law which shows you how are the processes that you need to follow to make a will. And for me, I think the wills are very important. Wills are, it's a form of insurance. It's a way in which you declare how um, your properties are supposed to be shared after you die. And particularly for people who are dependent on you. So it's a form of insurance to make sure that, you know, since we, none of us knows when we are going to die, you make provision for how your resources should be used to look after your children or dependent parents or others when in case you pass away. So wills are very, very important in our life. 
Absolutely, I definitely agree with that. What role do lawyers play when it comes to someone acquiring a will? Okay. You know, because in law school, lawyers are taught the law relating to will making. We know the rules because there are certain rules that if you don't follow, then whatever you did at the end of the day, the court can declare that it is not a proper will. So some other law kicks in. So law, lawyers basically assist clients in the drafting of wills, and we also advise on how it's supposed to be, you know, the, the, the Wills Act also indicates where you're supposed to lodge a copy of a will once you, you finish it. We are also able to help people, you know, once you've done a will, it doesn't mean that as soon as you die, it kicks in. There's a process you need to follow. You have to go to courts, get probate, et cetera, et cetera. And that is an opportunity for the courts to ensure that the will has been done properly before they give a paper called the probate. And that is what the probate is given to usually the executors, whom the one who died named in the will. Of course, if the executors refuse to act, there's another process by which any of the beneficiaries can apply as um, administrators with the will are next and then share in accordance with the law. We have some other laws that kick in as well. So lawyers help clients to make good wills, which will stand the test of time. Mm. Do do lawyers need to do the will for you? How, is, is, is it just lawyers that do wills? Not necessarily. I mean, anybody who knows what the rules are can put their will together. I mean, the key thing about making a will, you know, to be clear about your instructions so there's no ambiguity, etc. But the key thing is the manner in which the will is executed. That is how it is signed. The law requires that when it is being signed, when the, the, the testator, who is the one who is making the will, is signing it, it should be signed in the presence of two independent witnesses, okay? So ordinary person, once you know how to, you know, there was even a project where they showed people how to make wills, but then the instructions about how you should sign it in such a way that the two witnesses are present when you're signing, they don't need to see the content, but they have to witness your signature and then they have to endorse that on the document before it can it will be deemed to be a good will. The exceptions to that are very few. It's soldiers who are on the field, et cetera, et cetera, who can do it without or with one or two, one, one person, but to, at least two, with a test, we call them attesting witnesses, it's very key. So if you know the rules, you don't need a lawyer to, to do that. If you don't know the rules, then we always say, we would advise you to get a lawyer to help you so that at the end of the day, your wishes, because whatever you have, it's things you worked hard for. You have every right to determine how it should be shared or used after you pass away. If you don't do the will well, then the court would say the will is not effective. And you begin to have wow. died intestate, you know? And we have a law which um, kicks in once a will is ineffective or you didn't give a will at all. There's a law called the Intestate Succession Act, which was passed in 1984. Five is the way in which the states, the rules the states have put in place to share your properties if you did not make a will or if you did a will which was not um, effective. And the other key thing is that the will should relate to properties that you acquired yourself. So, for instance, if you're a chief or you're holding something in trust which is not yours, you're holding it for a group of people, you cannot pass it. You can, if you put it in a will, you know, it, it, you can't give it away. So, it's self acquired properties, properties you had at the time you did the will. Or properties you anticipate to be coming to you in a short while before you, I mean, by the time you pass away, then you can share how, I mean, decide how it should be distributed, who it should go to, basically. Okay, so basically, if you don't have a will, you're, you may lose your properties. It might not go to your family members. No, it will go to your family members. What, what I said is, it so we have the will act. Then the default situation is, which is what happens to most people. They don't need a will, or if the will is declared as invalid. Then there's a law called the Intestate Succession Law, okay, mm -hmm. which was passed in 1985, PNC Law 111. So this law has provisions which ensures that your properties are distributed in such a way that majority goes to the nuclear family, okay? Before 1985, it depended how properties were shared, depended on so many factors. Um, whether you are patrilineal or matrilineal, whether your, your marriage was registered under the ordinance or it's a customary marriage, whether you're Muslim, etc. But from 1985, a uniform law was passed to regulate. Basically, just to give you a, a quick gist, um, basically the law says that 
at least one house and all household chattels belong to surviving spouses or spouse and children automatically. Okay. Then whatever is left, I call the residue. The residue, depending on who you left behind, is divided into a certain um, forms of fraction. So for instance, if a person died, leaving a spouse and children and parents, after you've taken out one house and all the household chattels, which is which includes a private car and everything, everything in the home is private chattel and is chattel, are given to them. The rest which is left is divided into 16 parts. The residue is divided into 16 parts. Out of those 16 parts, nine over 16 goes to surviving children. Three over 16 goes to surviving spouse. And the remaining four is divided into two. If they're surviving parents, two goes to them. And then two is shared in accordance with customary law. So if you're matrilineal and the um, nephew or niece is supposed to inherit, that's the one that is then shared. If you also don't have any parents alive at the time you die, then the, the oh. four of us left is shared in accordance with customary law. Their fraction changes. If you only left children, but no spouse, then after the one house and household chattels are taken out and given to, 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 to the, sorry, I said, if you die without, what did I say, without, um, if you didn't have um, a spouse at the time you died, but you had children, the, the one house, all household cattle goes to them. Then the remainder, which is um, um, the, the, the residue, is then divided into four. Three of the four goes to the children. And then the remaining four is shared, you know, either to survive, a bit of surviving parents and then to the family, you know, two, two. If, on the other hand, if you left a surviving spouse, then the fraction changes again. Same, you left a surviving spouse, but no children. Then you take out one house, all household chattels, then whatever is left behind is divided into two. The surviving spouse will take about half, and then the remaining will share in accordance with, you know, a bit to your parents and, and the rest. So there are, you know, all kinds of ways. Then if you had no, no spouse, no child, but you had parents, mm -hmm. then, you know, it goes about, you know, the, 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 the house and the chattels goes to the surviving parents, and then, a bigger chunk also goes to them, and only a little part goes according to customary law. So the law has made adequate provision to protect the immediate family. So if you don't have a will, or your will is declared is invalid, there's adequate provision there on how the properties are supposed to be shared. Okay, we've, we've got a question from Hilda. She says that, is there a set fee that is charged by lawyers? Um, I think she's been overcharged um, somewhere, and is it, you know, is it a set fee or is it... Um, how how is it? How are people charged? For um, you know, from time to time, the Ghana Association comes out with a scale of you know, what they call the Bar Association a, a, a fee guideline that's supposed to guide us in uh, um, charging. Some go strictly by it, others are flexible. And I know that according to the Ghana Bar Association scale of fees, it's a certain percentage of the value of the properties is, can be charged by lawyers. Personally. I don't believe in that. I like to encourage people to make wills. So I have a flat, reasonable fee which people pay. I, I believe that one of the, is it what, almost like a, a semi you know, CSR is to try to encourage people. So it's a very small fee that I charge and then we try to encourage people to make wills. But there are some lawyers who would try and have some kind of a value of the properties involved and then charge you a certain percentage. Wow. Charge you a percentage. Okay, okay. Certain, All right, I'm gonna come. Yeah, sorry, it's okay. Okay, no, go on, go on, go on, go on, finish. No, so my, my point is, it's it's a very flexible thing. I mean, the guidelines are there, but it depends on how you apply them, you know, depending on your your, your interests in a particular issue. So, yeah, it's flexibility. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to come back to you. We're still going to continue laws, but I'm going to now head over to my boss, Jacqueline. Um, you know, as the MD at um, Enterprise Life, please share with us a bit more about what your firm does. What does, what, you know, what does um, Enterprise Life um, do? Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Denta. So Enterprise Life actually is one of the six uh, operating companies under the Enterprise Group which is a financial services group here, here in, in Ghana, which has a, a mantra that says that we want to provide solutions for Ghanaians from the gray, from the cradle to the grave. And for us at, at Enterprise Life, we are the life assurance wing of Enterprise Group. 
So we're licensed and we started operations in um, the year 2000. And one with a core mandate uh, to provide life insurance solutions. And our vision really is, is to ensure that we provide all who come into contact with us their desired advantage because we are the best in writing life insurance and um, solution. Really, we have done that by ensuring that we are offering uh, bespoke solutions um, to as many Ghanaian families as possible. In doing that, we have ensured that we, we really have a, a well-structured and a beautifully modeled distribution and, and channels or lines, and then a very strong, well-built back office uh, management structure that allows us to provide these um, the solutions to, to our clients. And let me also add by saying that in terms of our business, in terms of what we offer uh, for our clients, we focus specifically on, on life insurance and, and no other um, 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 business operation in that in that space. And it, okay. we have different classes uh, or categories in which we provide our business. So we do the insurance for persons, what we call the retail, and we also do insurance for corporate um, and employees within corporate institutions. And, and let me say that in, and then we also have what we call the special market um, um, panels as well. And even in terms of the retail, we have ensured that in, in, in providing life insurance solutions to as many Ghanaian families as possible, we have um, really segmented the market and ensured that for each level of the market, we are providing solutions, life insurance solutions, right from the high end of the market to the low end um, um, of the market um, as well. So in summary, this is what um, we do uh, as a life insurance uh, company, providing life insurance solutions. Fantastic. And, you know, having worked in the insurance space for a while now, do you think a lot of Ghanaians pay enough attention to insurances generally? I would say no. Uh, and, and probably, <laughs> I, I can see Sheila, Sheila laughing. <laughs> Sheila, I guess I'm right, right? You're right. Absolutely right. You are right. <laughs> well, okay, so no. And the reason uh, being that people don't pay attention uh, to insurance because naturally uh, people think that insurance is, 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 is not important. I mean, and therefore they don't need insurance. And also there's the understanding that insurance would always remind you of the unfortunate events of life. Everything we talk about is so morbid. We always reminding people about death, about accidents. I mean, a story really is nothing exciting, you know, and therefore it's one thing that I, I think impacts the way people see it. Then again, I think people's experience um, of it, the perception that insurers just take money, you don't pay claims. I mean, some are perceptions. There have been, I must say, there have been some actual incidences, but even that, I believe things can be uh, can be explained. So. Um, people think that one insurance, you have to put your money in something you can't see. You don't, I mean, the benefit is not immediate. It's long dated. I mean, the product is not tangible. Why should I put in money for a long period of time? I'm always thinking about um, should something happen and stuff like that. So people naturally don't want to uh, buy um, um, insurance uh, really. And I've heard people say, that even for, for motor insurance, if there was no law back in that, they really wouldn't have bought um, insurance. But let me use this platform to say the entire, that insurance is, is life insurance really, is something everybody needs, even if they don't want it, they need it. I totally agree. And then I'm sure, you know, looking at COVID-19, there's been a lot of unexpected deaths where people, which I even had um, a text um, from a lady, Let's see if I can find her text. Um, she was like, you know, Denta, I wish this topic is so important to have because she said she lost her mother and there was no cover, there was no nothing. And she wished she had, you know, done life insurance or something for her parents because there was nothing. Um, so I'll head over to Emma now. Um, you know, you're the head of corporate business at Old Mutual. Please share with us a little bit more about what the firm is involved in. Okay, so good evening to you, Denta. Good evening to your cherished viewers. And good evening to Sheila and the lady who refused to mentor me. 
Okay, so only a life insurance company actually can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So that's just by the way. So old mutual life insurance, <laughs> it's a household in insurance. A, we, we, we are, uh, yeah, that was by the way. <laughs> okay, Jeta. Okay, so old mutual life insurance, it's actually a household name in, a, uh, in insurance. So when you come to Africa, I mean, when you mention old mutual, old mutual is well known everywhere. Um, old Mutual started, that was in 1845, that's in South Africa. So currently, Old Mutual is over 175 years old. So come to talk about experience in insurance, yes, Old Mutual is there. Currently, Old Mutual, we can boast over 60 million customers across Europe, Africa, Americas, and Asia. Old Mutual came into Ghana, that was in 2013, by acquiring Provident Life. And in fact, we bought majority stake in Provident Life. And after a year, we rebranded into Old Mutual Life Insurance Company. Um, I would say for just seven years of operations in Ghana, we've chopped a lot of successes in terms of partnerships. And then when you talk about corporates, I mean, we have a lot of corporate um, partnerships as well. So come to talk about retail, that's individual policies. Yes, we have a lot of people in our, policy, in, in our books. Now, come to talk about what we do at Old Mutual. We have, we have two distribution channels. So one actually pays attention to individual insurance, that's the retail insurance, and one pays attention to, um, that's the corporate business. Now, before we came in, we came into Ghana to research to know what exactly Ghanaians need. So we came up with a menu that actually had sizzling insurance solutions. So. We said, okay, let's give hope to Ghanaians. There isn't hope when somebody loses their parents or when somebody dies. Um, I mean, somebody, when somebody dies whilst working, there's nothing of that sort. There is, but people are not really confident about the whole thing, like Jackie said. So what else can we do? We need a differentiator. So we came up with something we call group life. We came up with that because, one, people have actually moved from just looking at salaries, especially employees. So people come into interviews and they ask, after asking of, I mean, they, they bargain and negotiate on their salaries. They ask, do you have insurance for me? Now, as a corporate institution, if you want to get the best out of your employees, then you need to get an adequate insurance cover. People will end up giving their best because they know they are secured. Their employer thinks about them. So you get something to cover them while they are working, even to the extent of when they are off work. So it's actually we offer something that's actually a 24-hour cover. So whether you are home, you are at work, wherever you are, you are still covered under the group policy. We have in, uh, insurance cover that covers injuries as well. So whether you are permanently disabled, temporarily disabled, or you are critically ill, yes, you are also covered. So yes, we came up with that because we realized that hey, we need to come out I and mean, come up with something that should give um, employees, employers, competitive edge over I mean some of their competitors. There again, we also look at what the company is into or the corporate is into. Then we'll be able to sit with them and create a solution for them. So we don't normally have something on the, I mean on the shelf product or solution where we close on people or employers, but we actually sit with them, understand their business, and then come out or couch a solution for them on the corporate side. We also have some sweetness, or somebody would say freebies that we also give out to our corporate clients as well. So we are not just offering insurance solution, but we are actually partnering their business. So we go even beyond giving them insurance by giving them health, we organize annual or quarterly aerobic sessions for, for their employees. So with that, you don't just only buy insurance, but the insurance company is actually caring for their well-being in terms of health. They're also looking at their financial aspect. If you have a, a financially sound employee, that is when they are also going to give in their best as well. So what we have is we have a dedicated team as well that handles something we call financial education. 
And as I speak, everything, all these things that I'm saying, they come for free. So these are something like a complementary benefit that comes at the back of the solutions that we offer to do businesses. And let me talk about education. Um, let me talk about a retail bit. Now, the retail bit also has two legs. So one leg in the bank assurance space, that is our partnership with bank banks. And then we have one that's the freelance where we target any other any individual who can afford or who even can't afford insurance. We only sensitize them on the need to buy insurance. So on that, I only I always ask. People think they are oh, they are currently gainfully employed and they can always afford to pay school fees on their kids. But when unfortunate happens in the future, what would you what would you do? How would your, your kid actually move on in terms of education? Now, people have lost their jobs. Considering our current situation in, under COVID-19, companies have downsized. People have lost their jobs. Some have been retrenched and all that. Companies have folded up. This thing got to us on our ways. People have it, assuming you don't have any form of insurance at all. Does that mean your kids will have to drop out of school? But if you have a plan in terms of education plan for them, I mean, your, your kids are secured. Aside that, you can also decide that, okay, let me look at this. It's from this angle. I think in eight years time or 10 years time, my kid will be going to university. Let me start saving towards that. Yes, we have something of that sort for you. So we actually encourage you to do that. Now, I'm not targeting people who are just married, but I'm looking at the singles or newly wedded um, couples. If you don't have a kid, doesn't mean you can't buy education policy for your kid. You need to plan as a prudent parent for your kid. I think African parents, um, our parents will only start planning towards education when we come in. But then I think it will be prudent for us to start planning before our kids even come in. So that's another aspect. And then we have the transition bit that covers pure, pure um, funeral. That's a rich product. So that as well looks at the fact it covers funeral expenses. So you can cover yourself, you can cover your spouse, your kids, your parents, your parents, in laws and all. So yes, those are some of the things when Old Mutual came into the anime, we decided to look at. Of course, we have other other solutions like the mortgage insurance, insurance that covers, I mean, mortgage, we have credit life, we have something we call SIDs. So for the sake of time, I think, let me narrate it. Sure. Sure, sure. Thank you so much for that insightful um, information about your company. Um, I'll go back to, to, to Jackie. You know, you know, what do you say to somebody who says, you know, why should I prepare for my death? You know, what is your response to such a statement? Well, I, um, um, I would always say that, really, because people think that when you talk about insurance, you're always looking at uh, morbid things. Let me say that insurance is not really about planning for your death. Insurance really is about putting together or ensuring the financial well-being or the financial security of your family, just to ensure that your destinies are preserved, whether you live or you die. I think that's basically what insurance um, um, does. Why should you plan for, for death? Well, whether we like it or not, as, as, as much as it's morbid, it will happen. Unfortunately, I mean, it's the, it's the only surest thing in life, really. I mean, you cannot guarantee that you will be born, but I guarantee you that you will die. The question is that yeah. when that happens, nobody knows. In what form it happens, nobody knows. But the thing is that when it happens, are there consequences of that event? And all the time, the consequences of that event is born by your family. So planning for your family, really, it, 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 insurance is really planning for your family and not just, and not about death. Because there are so many things that can happen in your cycle of life that would impact you negatively and can change the fortunes of your company, of your family forever, which is not even death, which are other things that insurance companies um, take care of. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I'm glad that Sandra Ellis has put this on the screen. Do you have insurance packages for diasporans if their parents live in Ghana? And um, Enterprise Insurance certainly does. Um, I was... Um, 
one of the, the ambassadors who were promoting it um, widely on social media. It's called Aquantupa, but I'll get Jacqueline to explain more about the product and how important it is for people in the diaspora to really invest in that. Sure. Okay. So, um, Aquantupa is um, uh, one of our innovative um, 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 solutions. And, and, and as I said, at Enterprise, we want to ensure that we give all who come into in contact with us their desired advantage because we are the best at what we do. And that led us to the development of the product Aquantupa, which you, you, you know about. What, is, yeah. what does Aquantupa uh, do? You know, we, we, a research we did showed that most of the reasons for which Ghanaians send money down is for funerals. And I think it's, it's, it's also on the basis that um, it's not that we cherish the dead, but we want to ensure that we give our loved ones a really a decent and a dignified burial. I think that, that's the bottom line of it. You really want to give your loved ones a, a decent and a dignified burial. You wouldn't throw your dead mom on the street or go to a forest and just leave the person um, there. So I think culturally, it, it's something that it's of very, um, of, it's of great importance to us. So we realized that this was the challenge that they had. People were always wondering, I mean, we have to send money home for, and most of the time when these things happen, it's unplanned. You have your savings targeting to go and buy a plot of land. Now you know you need to go dip your hand into the savings or you're saving for your children's education. And then you have to go take this money. So the, 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 the import of savings then changes because now you have to take that money, invest in a funeral, which does not have any returns. So why don't you buy insurance to cover that? So we designed this solution that allows Ghanaians living and working abroad to ensure family members who are resident here in Ghana. The beautiful thing is that it's an online solution. I mean, it's just free. Just go to WW, well, I think you showed the, the, the link, right, on camera. And once you hit that button, you go there, you, you, can, you can find out how much it will cost you to buy a policy. Um, and then bingo, you are, it's a straightforward process. So you can ensure your family members, your mother, your father, your in-laws, your guardians, your foster parents. We have made that solution available to all Ghanaians living and working in Nepal. Okay. So somebody says, I wonder if there is a provision for life insurance for workers. I'm not sure how that works. Okay. Well, so yes, I think uh, uh, Emma spoke uh, 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 about that um, earlier on, what we call, um, we, we do that in the, in the corporate line. So this is where employees want to enhance the valuable position, employers want to enhance the valuable position for their, their employees, drive productivity, and it's one way of motivating your staff. Because touch wood, if, if you lose a team member, and remember that the, 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 the family loses um, um, income that is going to come to them, and therefore, you also want to ensure that the family is well taken care of. So the obligation that usually employers have to their employees, one of the ways they can address that is through a life insurance solution, which you talked about. And this is a case where empl employers will buy a life insurance cover on behalf of their, their employees. So they pay a premium and then the insurer agrees to pay out a, a lump sum uh, in the event that the um, employee um, um, passes off. So, and let me say that this, these are solutions that are prevalent in the Ghanaian market. Almost every insurer um, here is, is, is offering that solution for employee employers to buy cover for their uh, employers. But let me also say quickly that in terms of buying the cover, there are different um, options that you could, you could um, offer um, um, your employees. So usually the scope of cover is wide and you, you can decide to fashion this out based on what you perceive as, as, as the needs of the um, employee. So we try to tailor make the solutions in the manner that suits the employees um, of the organization. So these are available, it can be done. Denta, looks like we can hear you. I think you're on mute. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just going back to the Aquantupa. So Aquantupa, if I'm in the UK, Denta's in the UK, my dad and my mum both yeah. live in Ghana. Um, yeah. I can show them every month. Is it a monthly thing or do I have to pay it outright for the year? How does it work? 
Okay, so thank you very much. And in fact, let me let me also add that apart from even giving cover for yourself or obtaining cover for yourself for, for the your parents or your guardians or your foster parents, you could also get cover for yourself in the form of repatriation benefits because it's also one of the key findings that came up when we had opportunity to interact with Ghanaians living abroad, they worry. So I, I, I touch wood, and you know, some, sometimes they have document issues, they pass off, and, and nobody knows what to do with them. So we also, you can also buy a repatriate cover for yourself where the benefits now will be channeled um, to the home that manages um, um, you once you, 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 you pass off. In terms of premium, I can, I can assure you that it's a very flexible system. Like I said, we try to make our, our, our products bespoke. So you can decide to pay your premiums monthly, you can pay quarterly, you can pay um, annually. And let me say that where you decide to pay annually, we actually give you a, dis a discount for paying your premiums um, 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 annually. And for those in the diaspora, I think it's the best option because you get so busy, you get caught up in things and, and you may forget. And one thing that imparts claims management usually is when um, 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 insurers are not paying claims. So we've created the infrastructure. You can pay through Visa, MasterCard. You can play, um, pay through Unity Link, um, Family Link. So we have created relationships and all these are at the site. So when you go to the site, you buy, you pay everything online and you choose the flexibility that you want in, 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 uh, in paying um, and the benefits um, as well. Claims payment, everything is handled online. It's a very seamless, uh, sweet fantastic. process. Fantastic, fantastic. I'll go back to Sheila now. Sheila, you know what? A you know, you know when somebody does their will, how often can you update it? How often can you update a will? You can usually. Um, there are people who decide maybe after every two years, they want to have a new one, you know, and in law, once you have a new one made, you know, there's always a statement that you're doing away with the previous one. There are some two who want to retain the same well, but have what they call a codicil, like, you know, tweak a few things and additional things. So a codicil is an addition that is made to it. So there's no hard and fast rule. Um, a well-made well always has a residuary clause, okay? so. The items you have at the time you made the will, you list them, it goes to this, that, that, that. Then there's usually an omnibus clause, which we call the residuary clause, which says that, I mean, anything you've not specifically mentioned, but which you may um, have at the time you pass away, you indicate those who the residuary legatees would be. You know, usually people say their children or whatever, then it goes to them. So because once you have a residuary clause, you don't really need to come back every year to make a change. But it's basically up to you. There are some who decide from time to time that they want to have a new one done. Others to do it is there. I did mine when I was in my 20s. Now I'm in my late 50s. Wow. I haven't gone back to change wow. it. Okay. <laughs> yes, I haven't gone wow. back to change it. Yeah, because I, I, I wow. really don't see Beverly. Yeah. Pardon me. Beverly, Beverly, Beverly says that, you know, Sheila mentioned independent witness. Who is an independent witness? It's somebody who is not benefiting from the will you get it somebody who is not being mentioned specifically in the will then you can the person can be um an attesting call it an attesting witness an attesting witness then somebody's also there's another question do you, do you want me to look at it yeah. no it yeah. says that the child who is not mentioned in a final will and below 18 years of age gets any law protecting him or her Yes, there's a provision in the Wills Act, Section 13, which says that if a person makes a will and doesn't make provision for, you know, parents, um, spouse, and a child below the age of 18, then within three years of the um, death of that person, you can always apply to the courts for reasonable provision to be made for you. You know, using the argument that there'll be a lot of hardships to you. So let's say a child who's of school going age. Um, you're still in school, your parent passes away, doesn't make any provision for you, then you can apply to the court. There are instances where um, some, you know, that, I, that I, I, well, what I recall is that around the time that intestate succession law came in 1985, there were some who believed in the traditional way of inheritance. So they made, they actually made wills to ensure that their nieces and nephews 
inherited majority of their properties and some didn't even make permission for their children or their spouses. So a few of them went to court to ask for some provision to be made for them. So the court can make provision once you establish to them that you are dependent on the person to some, to some extent, a lot of hardship will be caused to you um, because no provision has been made for you. Then the court can give you something out of the will to sustain you. So for instance, if, you know, um, a, a father dies, you know, he had a child somewhere else, you know, after that he dies and the, the, this child comes along and it happens to be his son from a previous girlfriend or whatever, can provisions be made for that child? Um, I mean, like I said, you remember, we're not talking about Section 13. It talks about children who are like 18, up to 18, or maybe ones that can show they are totally dependent. Maybe one who has a disability or other. If you, at the time you made your will, all your children are adults, you know, they finished school, 30 plus, etc. You have, don't have any obligation to make any provision for them. So in the scenario you gave, if that child, that somebody comes in and says, um, you know, oh, it was also my father, and that person is within that age group that I mentioned, you know, eight, 18, below 18, or even if a little above 18 is going to school and was dependent on him, yeah. etc., then provision could be made. If it can be established that it's the man's child, if it can really be established that it's the man's child, they can make provision for him. On the other hand, if that man didn't make a will, it becomes more controversial when the person didn't make a will. If he didn't make a will and he dies in test and then I mean, some other person comes in. In the test succession law, it makes provision for surviving spouse and surviving children, okay? okay. So if you can establish that it's that man's child, then the part of the of the law which says that um, surviving spouse and children are entitled to one house and all household chattel, that person also has a right to benefits in the same way as the missus's child. Okay. okay. There's an attempt to try to review the law so that some few changes would come. But as of now, some of the problems that come is, you know, the person usually when the a man dies and then the children from um, different um, mothers come in, they also are coming for their share of the property, etc. Of course, within the 916th of the residue I mentioned, if it's a large estate, there may be a lot to go around. But if it's a small estate, then it becomes um, very difficult. And sometimes what we say is that it leads to a fragmentation of the property because it's be difficult. Let's say there's not one house. There's missus who was used to live with the man and her children. And then suddenly children from three or four other sources come and said, yeah, we are also children. And this is the man who was paying our fees, etc. I also come to enjoy the same house with you. Obviously, it will be problematic. So sometimes what they do is just sell the property, share the money in accordance with this thing. So everybody can have their peace. So it can get complicated yeah. along the line, yeah. Mm. Can I use my will to disinherit my child? In the same way, as I indicated, if your child is grown up, so independent, not you're not you finished paying school fees. The child is fully, fully, you know, looking after himself or herself. You don't have to make any provision for that, that child. You're not obliged to make provision in your will for that child. I mean, if that person decides to go to court, it's up to the court to determine. But usually it's those who are dependent on you that can make that provision. Either if, the, if that child has a disability, some form of disability, then that one, irrespective of age, they're dependent on you throughout their life. So they can always go to court for permission to be made for them. But if that child is of sound mind, has you finished paying school fees, the person is on their feet, et cetera, et cetera, then you're not obliged. The other thing I just wanted to mention was that there are some people who also set up a trust within their will, okay? So people who have children who are young, when they make their will, they, they don't only appoint, and there are certain key elements in preparing um, a will. You need an executor, you know, one or two people who will stand in your place to distribute the property, etc. So sometimes people appoint them as executors, trustees. Then they can look a bit of a clause in the will where they set up a trust, saying that maybe this particular property should be invested, it should be rented out, some of the school fees used to pay the school fees of my children, and it's only afterwards that it can be distributed. There's a one matter that I handle where the man set up a trust, so the money was used to look after his children, etc. He settled the highest level of schooling. Then afterwards, he decided to give 
a house in a prime area in Ghana to his um, nieces in the village. And there's nothing you can do. He's finished, you know, the, the executives made sure they paid the school fees, people did masters, people did all kinds of things. I think the last one was like 30 something, had finished a masters, etc. So the man said, he had finished. So now this village people are going to inherit this posh house. It's his choice. He's taking care of responsibility. Yeah. So that can happen. Wow. So can you can you explain what the executor is and a personal representative does as well? What do they actually do? So they are this. You know, normally that when somebody dies, that there, there are two types of um, personal representatives we have: either an executor, which is somebody who was named in the will as the to be the executor and who went to court to get a probate. That's a personal representative. If the person didn't leave a will and has to go, the properties have to be shared in accordance with the intestate succession law. Then um, the law indicates that um, a number of people have the option to apply for letters of administration, you know, surviving spouse, some of the surviving children and the family, a maximum of four. It could be one up to four max. Then they can apply to the courts for letters of administration to enable them to also share the properties in accordance with the intestate succession law. So in that case, you know, that administrator, they, they are called administrators, not executors. So executors and administrators are referred to as personal representatives who stand in and distribute and then manage the estate of a, a diseased person. Okay. Sheila, when would you recommend, I mean, you mentioned that you did your will when you were 20. When is the right age to do a will? You know, you can do what I tell people, you know, people, people always think that you need to have lots and lots of houses before you make a will. What I tell people is, your, you know, whatever you've been working in and any assets you have, it could be chattels, it could be anything. So for me, the earlier, the, 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 the better. You, 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 you know, because the clothes you have, the kente clothes, the, you know, anything that you have, you can make a will. So for me, I, I, when we do our outreach, we always tell people, it doesn't matter how young you are. Once you start working, have a, a will there. You can always change it. You know, at any time. So it's it's just a good practice to have. You know, I keep saying it's we're all working so hard. I mean, you people stay up in the night to work, etc., and then they buy a car, they buy something, etc. You don't know what will happen tomorrow. So for me, have a will in place. You can always change it. It's better to have a will to determine how what you've acquired through your hard work is shared than to leave it to the the states to determine how it should be shared. Absolutely, absolutely. I think Emma, can you answer this question or that's on the screen? So it says a Ghanaian living in the US with an executive in the US. What can I do to ensure my property in Ghana is covered? Do I need a separate Ghana will or just an amendment to cover the Ghana property? You know, there are, there are some countries that um, sort of have a sort of a bilateral, this thing, like in the UK, et cetera, et cetera. What will happen is if a person has a will, I have handled wills which were made in the UK, it was probate was granted in the UK, then our laws make provision for you to come and register. If their property, part of the properties are located in Ghana, then there's provision for you to come and register it in our high courts in Ghana. And then that property can be shared in accordance with the dictates of the will. In countries where there's no such, you know, bilateral type, enforcement of contracts, etc. it becomes a little more difficult. So um, what some lawyers would advise is, you know, so for your properties that are in other jurisdictions, make sure that you have um, maybe a separate will covering those ones from that, that other one, from the ones that you're, you're located in. So you would have to find out from your, the country in which you're located in where, where that contract can be enforced you know, there are, there are bilateral agreements under which certain contracts can be enforced easily. And then you, you do what okay. is required. Yeah. Okay, okay. Emma, how long does a typical life insurance contract last? Okay. I think before I answer your question, you haven't been fair with me because you have two kids here. You have enterprise and individual. Okay. So let me, let me just talk about the... <laughs> The, sorry, life insurance for our fellow Ghanaians in the diaspora. So just log on to our website, 
the WhatsApp number as well that has already been shared. Just put in your details. Somebody will contact you and put you out. So our fellow Ghanaians or our fellow um, siblings in the diaspora, you are not left out. Please log on to our website or WhatsApp or send a WhatsApp message to the number that has been given and you will be sorted out. Now, back to my question. A typical life insurance cover actually covers the life as long as the life is paying um, a premium and the life is still alive. So once the, the rate that has been covered crystallizes, then the life insurance ceases. But once the risk doesn't crystallize and the insurer or the principal person keeps paying premium, then the life insurance contract is still in force. Now in Ghana, there's a law that says no premium, no cover. So you can have an insurance cover all right, but once you stop paying premium, there's nothing like contract. So that's it for, for, for the contract bit. Okay. And then what's the minimum amount one can invest in life insurance um, when you're just starting out? Okay, that's a fantastic question. Um, we place value on our lives. So the kind of value you place on your life determines the premium you have to pay. So there's no cutout premium for anyone. The premium is actually dependent on the value you place on your life. So I can decide to do a $1 million cover for myself, and that will determine the amount that I have to pay. And I can also decide to take a hundred, uh, sorry, a 10,000 or a 5,000 life insurance cover for myself, and that would also determine the premium that I would, I mean, pay. So there's nothing like a cutout fee for somebody. Normally, I would say the rate, it's something small. That is about probably 0.5% of the total amount that you are asking for. So there's no fixed amount, but you will have to place the value on yourself. Unlike um, a general insurance or when you have a car, the car can be valued. So you are able to tell that this is the premium that I'm going to pay. But on life insurance, you actually value your life. There's no cattle fee for that. Okay. All right. Can you answer the question that's on the screen? Okay. So I would like to know under what circumstance can an employer who has already signed on to a workman's compensation policy be able to convert into a group life policy without infringing the WC Act? Okay. So what we normally do is we normally say the WC Act is a bit limited. Limited in the sense that normally it covers you when you are working, but group life covers you even when you're not working. So it's a 24 hour. Now, what you can do is WC actually looks at paying compensation up to five years of the person's um, annual salary. So, if you want to take something of that sort, we really encourage people to do something to actually match what the WC. Benefit is so that you really encourage the WC Act. Now, WC Act actually was actually for um, I mean, enacted for um, factory hands because no, those times people could get injured and there's nothing of that sort for them to realize that the laborer would go home injured without anything. So, WC was actually couched to cater for such people. But now, if you are working in a high end company, I mean, a well set up corporate institution, we would urge you to do something more than that. So, normally, we normally encourage people to do something more than what the producer has. So, we could, uh, uh, encourage you to do something above, I mean, 60 months of your salary or do something about maybe eight times or this is underside. So, yes, you can do something more or much the producer. But don't forget that uh, Kelly, that's the it's a bit enhanced, so you have something with called critical illness that is added to it. Now, critical illness, when, that is when somebody suffers from a natural um, illness that involves huge sums of money. Let's talk about stroke. Let's talk about cancer. If somebody has a breast cancer. WC doesn't cover that. WC will not cover breast cancer. Okay. Covers as I mean, so yes, you can take a group life, but make sure the, 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 the value involved would either match or be more than what the WC Act is asking. 
And also, um, back to you, Jackie. I mean, people say that, you know, when you do life insurance, get in the money when the person dies. I mean, how does that work? What is the process of actually, you know, getting the money paid to the family once um, somebody passes on? Well, okay, thank you. So, you know, in, a, in, in the life insurance con uh, contract, usually the events that should trigger the payment uh, are most of the time named. So, for example, if you buy a life insurance policy and you are buying cover for critical illness, I think uh, Emma just talked about it, where we cover all the critical illnesses like the strokes, the cancers, the heart attacks, name them. Usually all these are named in the policy um, um, document or you, you, you get cover for hospitalization benefits, where once you spend a certain minimum number of days or nights in the hospital, uh, a benefit is paid out, or if you buy, say, personal um, accident cover, and you want cover for should you become permanently disabled or temporarily disabled, these are paid out. So in the claims process, obviously you need to provide evidence that these things have happened. So for example, if you, you bought a policy to ensure, say you, you, you bought a funeral policy to ensure your mom, and touch would you lose your mom, you need to give us evidence that you have you have lost your mom, and there are different documentations that usually uh, policyholders can, can can show in this in this area. So you could have your the death certificate, uh, uh, medical cause of death, anything that confirms that the incident um, really um, has happened are documents that the insurer uh, would want. So similarly, if it's a hospitalization benefits, then we would want evidence that you have been in the hospital, the number of days you have been there, and then that will trigger. So Yes, the event which was covered um, for which the promise was made to pay the benefit, we would need evidence that those things have happened. Secondly, you also want to be sure that you are paying to the right uh, person, of course, so you would you, you would get some documentation. The person will have to complete a claim form indicating, and um, that will usually ask a few questions. I think it's important to say that, uh, people say that claiming from insurance is, is difficult, but let me say confidently, Denta, that, that was in the past. I think the current uh, breed of insurers have really improved significantly in terms of claims because the reason why we are in business is we are in business to pay claims. We are not in business to collect premiums. We are in business to pay claims, but we must receive the premiums so we can make due our promise when the uh, event gets triggered or, 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 or happen. So for us, our philosophy really, and let me say something that we are extremely passionate about in enterprise that mm. our claims assessors must look for reasons to pay the claim rather than repudiate the claim. And I'm happy to say that even in Ghana, our, our industry, our regulator is also passionate about that. So there are clear guidelines that they have issued when it comes to claims. This is because they want to ensure that we are paying claims. So we have, uh, we, we want to ensure that we are paying our claims within 48 hours once you have submitted documentation. But usually, some claims tend to delay because, one, probably the, the insured is not able to really give us evidence of the event having happened. Uh, I mean, we've had situations where the, the, somebody has bought a funeral policy dental and oh, there are family disputes, there are issues, and therefore the person is not getting access to the, um, the death certificate or the medical cost of death. The good thing is that okay. insurers now have forensic units, they have investigative units who do their work and they're able to make do the promise within 48 hours. So we have changed. And with the use of technology and strategic partnership and with, with, with other uh, third party um, and solution providers, claims payment has really changed. For example, okay. in Ghana now, in 2018, for example, let me tell you that the life insurance industry paid not less than 1.9 million Ghana cities a day in claims. Wow. A day, a day in claims. So we're looking at about uh, claims of around over 700 million. So it tells you that this this perception that insurers don't pay claims has changed and has changed drastically. Wow, that's fantastic. Because they always feel like, you know, once you make a claim, then they say, come and bring this, come and bring that. But they, they, people are saying that, oh, when they want your money, it's easy to give them. And then when you want, you know, when you want when you want to claim is a whole different story. And so I think people also get worried about, you know, how they are able to access that money once something goes bad. Well, that's a genuine, that's a genuine concern. And uh, the, there are so many things that go, that goes into, into claims 
payment. Like I said, the fundamental thing that insurer wants to do is to validate the fact that the basis of the, uh, the event, which is the basis of cover, really has, has occurred. Now, the onus is yeah. on the or the insured to prove. So you said you are buying cover from your mother. If your mother passes off, touch will be, you want us to pay you 30,000 Ghana cities to help you manage the funeral expenses. And you can't, you can't come to uh, any insurer and say, okay, my mother is dead, pay me the 30,000. Of course, they need evidence to, to show yeah. that indeed your, your mother has passed. And sometimes insurers have had to be a little bit rigid because of experiences in relation to fraud. People have tried to perpetrate fraud on insurance companies. Wow. I mean, I have seen so many examples where people have bought fake death certificates. I mean, people have bought us some kind of reports that, I mean, even fake medical costs of, of, of object. I mean, much humane giving certain um, documentation, so many things. And therefore, insurers also have to be very prudent. Remember, okay. the promise is not to pay just you. It's a pool of fund that we are looking to pay as many as will suffer over a period. We need to protect the fund. So yes, we will take the premium. Yes, we want to pay the claim, but give us a reason as an insured to, to, to pay the claim. Absolutely. But I think there was a question about, can I buy a term yeah, no. assurance policy? Yes, we'll go back to that question. Um, Chrissy, can you put Jackie answer? She had a question. Um, that I wanted Jackie to answer, if you can find it before we go to this next question. Okay, Jackie, it's on the screen now. So it says, are there any term life policies that parents can procure for their children and be able to borrow against uh, the amount paid uh, to date for? Well, yes, so you can buy a policy, um, um, a term life policy, and then, of course, your children become the beneficiaries because you are covering yourself because, your, for example, your children are in school and there's the risk that during, I mean, you can't tell tomorrow what will happen. You could die, you could become permanently disabled, you, you, you could suffer a critical illness. So you can buy term assurance products when your kids are named as, as the beneficiaries. The good thing about term assurance products um, is that you can also assign it, I mean, to, to an institution. For example, you want to go for a facility. The institution also wants to be sure that touch wood should something untoward happen, um, they would be able to get their money back. So yes, you can borrow and then use, assign your, your life insurance and, and, and product to the, 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 the lending institution that can be done. And in that yeah. case, and if, the, also, if, if the event is triggered, what will happen is this. So for example, you have bought a term assurance cover for say a 20 year uh, cover for say 10 million, um, 10 million um, Ghana cities or maybe even 1 million Ghana cities. And then you go for a loan from a bank and maybe there's just a, a five-year uh, loan. Let's say that the policy would expire maybe 20, 30, and you've gone for a, a loan that, that you're supposed to pay, say, by 2025. And the bank wants you to get a life insurance cover. And you're, you can use, you can assign your existing term assurance product um, to uh, the bank. So touch wood, should they, um, should they uh, event, uh, the event okay, and say you have to pay a debt claim of one million, if the loan that you went for was 500,000, 500,000 will be paid to the bank. Then the remaining 500 would be paid to your named beneficiaries, in this case, the, the named okay. children. Yeah. Okay. All right. Jackie, you have another question on the screen. How prudent is it to, to borrow, <laughs> to take a life insurance cover? And, and uh, what? Under what circumstances will you, as an insurance expert, advise this? Wow. <laughs> Why will I borrow to buy life insurance? Um, hmm. Okay, so I'll look at it in two folds. For a savings product, I don't think it's something I want to do. Because it is possible that the interest payment on the, on the, cov on, on the loan could be higher than um, um, the, the, how, how, the, how quick the fund, the investment fund or, or your insurance policy is, 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 is going. And so therefore it's a risk. I, I don't think it's prudent really um, to do that because if so many things happen, I mean, in life and really when it comes to the investments that insurers manage or the portfolio they hold to ensure that they can meet these liabilities could also go through some some challenges or, uh, in terms of returns or gains that they make. But I do, for, for, for a savings product, I don't think it's a risk I would want to take. But okay. perchance, 
for a pure risk product, which is a, a term assurance product, which basically you are buying to ensure that you are guaranteeing your family income in the event that you, the breadwinner, are there. In the short term, I, th I don't think it's it's wrong if if you 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 use some um, facility to to fund that, especially if it's in the short term. Probably you are going through a, a, a quick liquidity issue over a short term, and therefore you want to do that. But if it's a long term, then that is risky. What that means is that you are not able to really fund the policy, and if you are not able to fund the policy clearly, you are not on 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 the path to uh, um, and enjoying the the benefits, and you won't get the family will not get that piece of. So uh, really, it's, 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 it's double-sided. For, for a savings product, I won't take the risk. Perhaps for a short-term uh, uh, product, I, I could consider. I must say that in some jurisdictions, eh, I think um, it, it happens in the UK as well. For some jurisdictions, there are actually companies that actually give people loans to pay for their life insurance covers. And touch wood, so the uh, death or care, for example, they claw back um, the amount from the from the benefit, and then the, the remaining will be paid off to the beneficiaries. So in some jurisdictions, they do it. For term assurance, I will, but for savings, okay, all right. Um, <laughs> before we continue, I just want to say to the viewers, I hope that you are enjoying um, tonight's session. Please make sure that you are sharing your pages if you're watching us. On um, YouTube, make sure that you subscribe and share it. As you know, on um, YouTube, you can share it on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. Keep sharing those pages. If you're watching us on Facebook, make sure that you share your page, do a watch party. I think these conversations are very, very important for us to have. So if you haven't already shared your page, please share your page and make sure that somebody gets to hear this really, really important conversation that we are having today. I can see everybody who's on the screen that hasn't shared. I'm gonna be mentioning names if you don't share very, very shortly. So please do share your pages and make sure that someone somewhere is getting this beneficial information that we are discussing today. And um, I just wanna mention actually um, for Emma and Jackie, the David Beckham, the soccer legend ensured his legs and face, okay, for 100 million. He insured, okay, for 100 million pounds, not dollars, we're talking about British pounds here. Why is it that people who are not from our community find it so important to insure themselves but our community, we don't believe in ensuring even body parts that some people are doing here. Um, Emma, do you want to go first? Then I can. Emma, do you want to go? You're muted. I think Emma's on mute. She's on mute. Emma's Emma's on muted. Muted. Yeah. Right. Okay. Come on. Okay. I think earlier on, I did mention that hey, you you can you have to play value on your life. So he thinks he wants to insure his face and his leg at that, at, in fact, at that amount because he knows the essence of insurance. Now, in our, in our setting, I think Jackie mentioned something. People have naturally embraced insurance because of past experiences. Now, people, are, people see insurance, uh, insurance as fraud. I mean, how do you expect me to pay something and I get it when I'm injured or I'm, I'm no more? People have actually not accepted the concept of insurance. In Ghana, we have the culture of saving and not buying insurance. So that's how come you realize that, I mean, the banking sector is flourishing, but you come to insurance and we have to struggle. I mean, we have to steal things, cajole people some, somewhere along the line to accept insurance. Now, people have had terrible experience in the past, especially on the motor side. But I mean, Jackie said, we are, we are into business. We have a contract. Initially, we said, okay, we are going to pay it. Ourselves. When something happens, you, as a party of the contract, have to also present it. Ourselves. Now, the person doesn't have that. Yes, the person wants to pay the insurance. I mean, it doesn't happen. Even sometimes, we have, we insurance, have been to the room and paid something we call an expression. Not because we are supposed to pay the insurance, but just to give the confidence of people. To embrace insurance. NIC is also there to support us. So now what we are doing is to sensitize people 
that in the past people have had terrible experiences people also don't see the reason why they have to buy insurance because hey i want to jump into my money as and when i want but insurance unless something happens i mean unless um the rates that have been insured crystallizes and people are not so patient when it comes to insurance so that culture has been built from the onset in fact i don't know where we got that culture from so we are now trying to educate people to encourage them to buy insurance now a Ghanaian wouldn't spend so much to ensure his space of his neck they think oh when it happens at least my family is there to take care of me so why should i even worry myself about that but i think we have to go from that era where we think the burden has to be transferred to somebody we have to be responsible in our own way to cater for some of these things. So we need to buy insurance. We need to move away from the old method of doing things. People think, okay, let me put money aside. But hey, if you save towards that, something will definitely happen and you might jump into that money and spend it. So you might end up not using it for the purpose for which you are saving. But once you buy insurance, insurance is always there for you. Virus, so for us, I think we've gotten the fundamentals wrong. Our predecessors who came in also didn't help by, I mean, sometimes uh, the communities that we came, or we also have people who have educated the clients very well. So, uh, well, I would say it has two ways. We haven't played our part in the past. Yes, there are some bad knots in the industry where, I mean, they have their agents all over selling and people want to make money so we do also want business to do business that's one aspect of it but in a case where genuinely somebody has explained things to you you have accepted now when it comes to pay and you are not able to control your side of the contract then there's a problem now client thinks hey this company doesn't pay claim but that is not the issue we are here like jackie said to pay claims now when you go to old mutual's website we have we, we have a button just click there put your documents there we do our own checks it's as easy as that the regulator is also there to support so once you are not in agreement with anything that the, 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 the insurer is doing you have every right to report us so we are currently urging people to come on board insurance is very good people think oh once i die i mean i don't care what happens let me take it from that angle as well there is this music, I think, was it Peter Tosh who played that? He says everybody wants to go to heaven, but we don't want to die. That's one aspect of it. Yes, so <laughs> when I die, my people will take care of me, so why should I? But as a responsible person, I think you need an insurance for yourself and for your family. Now, you take something that in your absence, even pushing your family home. You could be the breadwinner of your family, and if you're no more, you can just imagine what will happen to your family. Your wife may be working, but don't forget that when you are alive, you had two, two streams of income supporting the family. Once you're no more, it's just one. And how will your, parent, your, your kids and your wife move on? They need some kind of pushing. But when you are no more, there's some kind of expenses that will be prepared at your, uh, your funeral. So how do your family also handle that? Now, death is inevitable. Like Jackie said, people always talk about it. We, we, we come preaching doom, doom, doom. And I quite remember I went in to sell insurance. That was in 2008 to somebody when I was in Bucky. The person started, oh, blood of Jesus. Like a whole lot of things. I mean, hey, I just have to take it. Because she said, hey, I, I am more here for you to be telling me things about death. But at the end of the day, it happens. We can't run away from it. And the exciting thing about insurance is it doesn't only cover death by covered injuries as well. So whilst you are alive, you can still even enjoy some of the benefits. So, I mean, it's simple. You just encourage people. Insurance is not expensive. Think it's expensive. For me, I think insurance is not expensive. It will never expensive. Especially when whatever you're going to earn is more than the premium you're paying. Now, for us at Old Mutual, we have a cover. You pay for 15 years, and you don't pay anymore, but your policy is still enforceable. So, I mean, somebody will say, she won't pay away, won't pay again. I mean, you can take it. We have a flexible payment plan for you as well. So, um, I would encourage my fellow families, please come on board. 
let's buy insurance. Let's support our economy as well. Now, um, was it 2011? I think according to NIC um, insurance only contributed, I think, about 1.2% to our, our GDP. Wow. So what are we doing to ourselves? Elsewhere, I mean, in UK and Co, you could have 20, above 20% of insurance premiums supporting their GDP. But they are actually helping their country to grow. We Ghanaians are not helping our country to grow. In your own small way, you can also support by buying insurance to support your families. Well, we encourage all. There's another benefit. Look, um, when you take your benefits, we don't do that task. We don't do that task from insurance. So if you're in this country and you're always complaining that, oh, I'm always being deducted tax, whatever I buy, I get deducted on all tax. Please, just buy insurance. When you're coming for a we we'll give you the exact money. You will not take tax. So please, let's support our economy. Insurance is very, very important. Each and every member of this country needs insurance. You can buy insurance in a, you can buy a small amount, I mean, provided you have the income. You don't need to buy something huge. Just check, um, somebody will say, cut your coat according to your cloth. And like I said, you can value your life. You depend, you decide the kind of value, um, I mean, to give to your life. So if you want a 5,000 and that is what you think you can afford, I mean, just go for it. By so doing, you are supporting the economy. You are supporting yourself. You are supporting your family as well. So that's that for my side. Thank you, thank you. So I think you have, no, uh, there's a question for you, um, Jackie. Yeah, okay, thank you. But uh, Denta, can I quickly just add to what Emma said on, on the David uh, Beckham yeah. uh, thing? You know, it, it's the guy has understanding that the source, my financial source is my leg. The guy understands it. Today, if he breaks his leg, his income is gone. What will happen sure. to the destiny of his family? The destiny of his family could be changed forever. Forever. The dreams, the hopes, the aspirations of his children will be, it will just go down the drain. So the guy has understanding and therefore he doesn't mind using part of his, his hard earned income really to protect the source of his income. It's very, very important. And that's why we say life insurance really is about helping you enjoy financial wellness and financial security. And I think that is one thing that sometimes we, we, we have a challenge here in, in our part of, of, of the world. And therefore we don't appreciate um, that because in, in your life cycle, anything can happen prior to you getting to retirement. And within those phases, especially your stage one, stage two, where you are taking care of children, you are, you are also going through your own professional development and all that. If, you, if something happens and you lose your income, what happens? That's the end of it, really. And you realize that the, the, this even thing about the family, family, I mean, if, if the family will take care, it's breaking down. When I was younger, the, 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 the wider family, the, the, the extended family support was so strong. I mean, I in my in my home, I remember we I mean our aunties were there, we had they were, we were a lot in the home. But now it's me, myself, my husband, my children. I mean, that's the life we find ourselves now. And therefore, touch wood. If you the breadwinner, you pass up. What happens to the kids? And I think David Beckham has that understanding. The reason why he insured his leg, because it's his leg that gives him um, his income. And if we all realize that, then that would make a uh, um, trigger uh, uh, an, an action. Does our principal policy help with moving the body to Ghana? Yes, yes, yes. So because we pay for repatriation. And let me say the good thing is that apart from the, 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 the policy, we have added some icing on the cake with what we call our transitions funeral home. So we have a funeral home that we take care of everything from your, we organize from the morgue services to the heads. I mean, 360, we do everything. And we have relationships wow. with, 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 with funeral homes abroad. So please trust us to take care of your loved one. And let me say that we also even cover Ghanaians who have gone abroad to say um, you, you, your, 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 your daughter is abroad and she needs help. Maybe she's delivered. Like, you know, we, we have the family support. So your mom goes over or the mother goes over to get support for a period. 
you could also cover and touch with if, if the person dies we will take care of repatriating um, um that that person back to ghana and we will take over support with um, the funeral services so we allow you to do, to do the morning whilst we take care of the hard work and preparing your loved ones to, to their final um, um, place of rest. So we, we, we can do that. Fantastic. Emma, you have a question, question on the screen. Okay, so it says, what happens if I pay premiums, but I don't make any claim under the funeral plan? Okay, so under our funeral plan, you only pay premiums for 15 years and then you stop paying. So if you pay premium and then you don't come in for a claim, I mean, after five years, we give you a portion of, I mean, whatever claims, uh, sorry, whatever premiums you have paid. So we pay 5% of it after five years of contribution. But on the, uh, on the 15th year, you stop paying premium and that's it for our funeral plan. Okay, all right. Guys, we have just about 30 minutes to go. Please put in your questions now. I know that there's a, a lot of questions on the screen at the moment, which we are going to pick up. Don't worry. We will make sure that your answer, your questions are answered. So now we're heading over to Sheila. Um, there is a question on the screen for you. Okay. So with Wales, is there a consultation fee before the flat rates for the services? Also, if new properties are being added, does it come... It's an extra cost. <laughs> the first part, I mean, like I said, in my firm, the fee that we charge incorporates consultation in it. So it's a one-off thing. In other firms, it may be different. You know, the principle is the first time you see a lawyer, you're supposed to pay an initial consultation fee, and then they will then tell you what the legal fee is. Uh -huh. But for me, I in my um, policy in my firm, for most people who do well, so I mean, they may not have any other work. They just want you to do a well one off and then help them to save it, and that's it. So the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rate which incorporates the um, consultation fee in it. Then the person asked, um, no, the second part of that other question, it was about, I'm trying to remember. Anyway, what happens if the extended family disputes the will? Anybody who has who wants to do it will, there's a process that they go through. They file what is called a caveat. So you file a caveat, it's a process in the court that is filed. It is filled out and then served on you to say, I have a caveat. I mean, I want to caveat the processing of the probates. Remember I said when a person dies, if there's a will, then there has to be, somebody has to apply for probates. When you file a caveat, the one who filed it will have to file an affidavit indicating the reasons why they are filing the caveat. And if the court is convinced about the reason, then they would uh, maybe set the will aside or whatever. Or sometimes they can ask you to even file a full suit for a full trial. But if the court is not convinced, then they will remove the caveat and then the probate will be granted for the properties to be shared. Um, yeah, I missed one question, but whatever. Yeah, so the yeah, processes. Can I? It says, can I insure my uncompleted building? Is that? Hmm. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I, I but I think, I, I don't think I, I, I'm, I'm on top of that. But given that, I know that when properties are being put up, some insurances are purchased in order to, to get that um, before the facility even gets up. I, I have a feeling that that can be done. Okay. Maybe Emma, I don't know I, if Emma has more information on that. Emma, do you have anything on that? Um, I don't have much, but I, I know it can be done. So what they normally do is to value the property and then come up with a premium for you. So yes, it can be done. Okay, okay. Um, there's something, Ike Man asked something, and I think Roberta is also asking it. Upon to part in COVID-19, please, any expectations? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. I, I, want, I, I want to give uh, our clients comfort that we have them covered totally. They should be rest assured that even with COVID, we have their backs, they are covered. Absolutely. Fantastic. It's not an exception, exclusion, yeah. Fabulous, that's, that's good to know because I think a, a lot of people were asking that question and they wanted some comfort to make sure okay, that I, I, that I, is. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. 
no, no, go ahead. I think it, 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 it was about the 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 insurance under. I think there's something they do. You buy insurance when the building is under construction. I think I've remembered that one. So it's done. You can buy your, your uh, uh, an insurance when the property is not completed. Yes, it's done. Okay, okay. Um, do travel insurance plans cover also cover pregnancies? Um, okay. No, I'm go ahead. You go ahead. Okay, so normally travel insurance um, covers emergencies. That's emergent medical emergencies, and they don't have a pre-existing conditions. So pregnancy is a pre-existing condition. So no, it doesn't. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's good to know. Um, so what does, um, somebody's asked, what does travel insurance policies cover then? What do they actually cover? Well, okay. So um, travel insurance is um, basically also supposed to give you peace of mind. Um, um, usually for when you travel, that's why it's called um, um, travel uh, insurance. I mean, typically when, when you travel, there is the, there is the possibility that you could also suffer an untoward um, event whilst you have traveled. So you could become sick. And remember, if you travel, for example, if you, I travel to the UK and I'm sick, I don't have any insurance um, in the UK to go to the hospital. If I go to the hospital, that would be me using hard, hard cash to really take care of those expenses. So if you buy a travel insurance policy, for example, it gives you peace of mind that when you travel, should it be any untoward event, um, the policy then uh, comes in to, to take care of that. I think there are about there are different um, scope of cover or different benefit packages under, under a travel insurance scheme. So like Emma said, you would have the medical emergency assistance. So if you've gone to the UK, you suddenly get sick, you need help, you want to go to the hospital, there's a number you just have to call. They, they work it out for you and then you can go to the hospital and you don't have to pay you don't have to pay any any bill for that you could also be um, i mean same as in your country you could suffer um an accident you could be involved in an accident same when you travel you could also find yourself in an accident where you could um, you could be injured or you could even die in, in in that accident when you have a travel insurance i mean it helps in terms of even repatriating and um, the body um, back back home to Ghana if you suffered a permanent disability, some compensation is given. We also have cover around um, baggage. So for example, if you travel and your baggage is delayed uh, um, over a period, uh, a benefit is paid out, or should your baggage get missing? We have what we call loss um, baggage as well. So when that happens, um, also uh, travel insurance gives you protection for that. And we also give um, um, cover in terms of when there's a, a liability as well, personal liabilities, you find yourself, you you destroy somebody's property. Maybe I come to the UK, I want, I pick a car and then I drive into your garage. I, I need to fix that up. If you have a travel insurance, all these things will come in to take care and, and indemnify you of, of, of the law. So travel insurance largely covers, uh, uh, these are the general, broad, broadly, these are the things that travel insurance uh, covers. Okay, you have another question on the screen. Does enterprise have an insurance for those living abroad that where air tickets are bought, are bought one when one needs to travel back back home and back? <laughs> oh, okay. So whether we have an insurance policy that offers uh, uh, gives clients the opportunity to buy air tickets to make sure to facilitate their travel. Uh, right now, I don't think we we have a product um, um, like that that specifically allows you to buy air tickets um, when you travel in and out. Probably this is a business idea. Thank you, Percy. I will take that up and see what I do with it. Thank you. Um, do we have a functioning and efficient health insurance scheme in Ghana? And what does the health insurance scheme cover? Emma, do you want to go at it or? Emma? You have to unmute yourself. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, well, I'm not into health insurance, but let me let me just, just share my thoughts on that. So, health insurance actually covers medical bills. That's my that's my basic understanding of health insurance. And currently, we know we have the NHIS, and then the private health insurance companies. 
So actually it covers, it's more or less like it gives you some kind of comfort that hey, whenever you, you are ill, you just walk into um, a service provider, an accredited service provider, and then you are taken care of. So it covers something we call the inpatients and the outpatients. So um, outpatients is when you are being um, hospitalized and being taken care of. There are ceilings in a way. So for outpatients where you're treated and discharged on the same day, um, it has a ceiling which is capped, that's the benefit that is capped. And then that's for the, the, the private insurance. But with a national health insurance scheme, um, it, it actually covers basic illness. So when the illness actually graduates, then it means you have to cough out money to take care of yourself. So that's when the private health insurance also comes into support. So um, yes, it covers illness, I mean, medical expenses and all that. So that's my, my understanding on the health insurance bill. Okay. Well, um, uh, yeah, that go on, go on. That one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think um, um, Emma Emma captured um, that as well. So yes, I mean, um, health insurance is similar to how you buy a funeral policy to say touch wood should should death occur, and um, should I lose a loved one, sim um, I, I get some compensation or you support me financially. So with without insurance, it's the same principle. So you also buy to ensure that you have peace of mind, knowing that should you fall ill, you know you don't have to. And because unfortunately, these things happen when it's unplanned. I mean, you can just be suddenly sick and, and if it's unplanned, you don't have money, how do you take care of yourself? So if you have a, a health insurance cover, what it does is that it allows you to get access to, to, uh, to health care, even when you don't have money um, 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 to afford uh, at the time when the, the event happens. And I think in Ghana, we have seen uh, some quite some traction um, in that space with the, first of all, with the national health insurance scheme, and then also, Currently, I think there are about 14 um, um, health insurance providers, I mean, commercial private insurance providers in, in our country, in addition to the national health, uh, national health insurance scheme. And once you're Ghanaian, you can register a very affordable premiums. Um, Emma mentioned that um, in terms of the, the uh, a little bit about the scope of cover, but let me say that from what we know, about 95% of diseases um, in, in Ghana really are covered um, and by the, the National Health Insurance Scheme, even though there are some exclusions um, um, where the, the scheme doesn't cover. But largely, 95% of illnesses in Ghana are covered by the scheme. Fantastic. Emma, you have a question on the screen. <laughs> Emma, you're muted. Emma, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> so it says, can I terminate my 14 months education policy? I have been affected by COVID and I need cash urgently. I have education policy with Old Mutual. Okay, so there's a contract and the contract says, this is what you want to do. So you have actually given us the go ahead that I want to contribute for maybe a minimum of five years, eight years, 10 years. Now you want to terminate the uh, contract even before when we all agreed on. It comes with its own consequences. There's a risk component involved in this. You end up losing the risk component. Initially, we, we in fact, the feature of this product is suggested up until when the, the policy matures, you cannot, or you can just come for a partial withdrawal but then if you want to terminate this contract just because you are you in fact you're hard up, then you lose the risk component, but you will get the 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 the, the investment bit. So basically, uh, it's not a good idea to terminate. Exactly. It's not a good idea. Okay, all right. Um Chrissy, can I have that um question back, please? As many people are currently stranded in Ghana during this time, how do we use our travel insurance? Yeah, so I so I want to believe that they bought their travel insurance. Probably somebody lives in the UK and is in Ghana now and has a a, a travel um, um, insurance um, cover. So definitely, if they get injured or they 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 need to go to the hospital and all that, their, their travel insurances 
would come in. So it's still very, um, very um, um, active. In fact, even one of the, the, the scope in terms of the offer also is the bit about, um, I, I know there are benefits around cancellations and then when the curtailment also. So, so for example, somebody came to Ghana, was attending an, a particular event and, and stuff like that. Sometimes some refunds are also done if these events don't, don't tend to happen. So once they are here, if they fall ill, they are, it, it doesn't change, it doesn't negate their, their travel insurance and, and, and policies. Because you are here, there's the possibility that you could be sick and you need to go to the hospital. So you would need your travel insurance cover to use um, um, at the hospital. You could be involved in an accident. Anything on top what can happen. And I'm sure that um, um, your travel insurance can, can, can be alive to ensure that you, you get the benefits due you. So your travel insurance is not lost because you're on lockdown. <laughs> okay, all right. Can you answer the question that's on the screen, Jackie? You guys should also talk about the uh, cons of insurance that causes people not not uh, be eligible for for claims. So these are the the reasons. I, I'm guess I guess a person person is asking the reasons why we repudiate claims or we don't pay claims. I think one of the issues that I, I raised earlier on for where we don't pay claims is one: if the event for which the insurance cover was issued has not happened. Sometimes people think that they bought A, when really what they had was B. We need to ensure that there is clear understanding at the time of signing on the solution so that you know that I'm getting cover for an apple. Sometimes people buy cover for an apple, but there's a situation that looks like an orange, and then they, they think that, oh, then I have I need this, this, this um, means I need to get a claim on that. And then they come in and they find that, that oh, my cover really is the is, is cover for an apple. So sometimes when there's misunderstanding, when 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 the, there's uh, the, the insured doesn't have deep understanding of the scope of cover, it is one area that really causes um, um, contentions when it comes to claims payment. The another other thing that affects claims payment is also when there's non-payment of premiums. Is one big thing. That is why insurers try to create um, a lot of systems or infrastructure that allow them to um, to pay uh, to collect the premiums. So. If you don't pay your, your, your premiums, because the agreement is pay me a premium and touch with should the insured event happen, I would pay you a lump, a lump sum to support you. Now, if that doesn't happen, if you don't pay me the premium, don't expect that should there be a claim, I will pay. So my promise to pay, make you and pay the benefit to you is based on the fact that you pay a premium. So one area that affects us largely and why insurance will pay claims if is if um, a premium payment um, are not coming through. The other thing that sometimes also affects claims is when um, there's a fraudulent intent, because then that means the insurer will try and validate and try and investigate to check whether the uh, the truth is what you are being told. Like I said, we've had instances where people have brought us, I mean, somebody says, my mother is dead. My mother was in this mortuary. You go there and they'll tell you, we don't even know this name. We have not seen it, this name in, in, in our records. We have, we have not received a life like that. On that score, we would repudiate uh, um, the policy and, and not pay a claim. So once you are able to fulfill your part of the bargain, I don't see why the insurance company would not be able to pay uh, the claims um, for you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, we have another question on the screen. Um, Jackie. What impact does the health insurance industry have on the credibility of the hospitals? Because these insurances are paying for necessary bills by hospitals, wrong medication, wrong diagnosis, or time needed, et cetera. Well, so I know that one of the things that the NHIS does really is that they validate uh, um, hospitals that uh, their, their policyholders um, really can can utilize so, and they take the trouble to inspect these hospitals and ensure that um, they have the facilities and, and then they, they facilitate and they offer the service. But indeed, I know that there have been situations where there have been challenges in, in respect to the quality um, um, of um, of the service that is being rendered. And sometimes there, 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 there even have been issues where there have been fraudulent claims or people are trying to claim when really they have not offered and, and the service. And one of the core functions of, of NHIS, which is the regulate, uh, regulatory authority, um, and they have the responsibility to validate and ensure that 
and the hospitals are well resourced. They have the equipment, they have the right caliber, the right personnel, the right doctors to ensure that they are offering the, the, the services. Also even included in that is the kind of validating the kind of medication that also um, can be given. So the authority has that mandate to ensure that that, that really is happening. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I think we have now Sheila. Um, we have a question for you on the screen. For her will constructed, passes away before the will has been completed by the law firm. Um, basically, then the will will not have been completed. So it's not a, a fully completed will. So the person will be deemed to have died intestate. So long as the document hasn't been completed and signed in front of, I mean, before two attesting witnesses, then it's not a completed document. So it will not pass as a fully completed will. The person will be deemed to have died in test and the description I gave earlier, the intestate succession law will kick in to guide the distribution of the person. So, so somebody will have to apply for letter to administration and then um, distribute the properties in accordance with the intestate succession acts. Okay. Must yeah. the will be read to the family? Must the will be read to the family? Yes. Yeah. Okay, one of the provisions there in the Wills Act of 1971, which I've been talking about, one of the provisions is that whenever you make a will, you have to deposit a copy at the High Court, okay? And if you don't deposit it, but after your death, people see, see there's a will somewhere, they have to quickly take it to the High Court. So usually the will is in Ghana. It's not done like we see in the US or whatever, in films where it's read at home, no it is usually read in the courts because the courts, they keep, it's under seal and it's kept in the safe. So um, when a person passes away, you can apply to the, to the registry um, to confirm that there's a will, they'll give you a date, and then you will meet, they have a, in the high court, they have a reading room in the courts where you, the family members will go and wait for it to be read. And after it is read, then you can formally apply for a copy. Then the executors who are named in the will will start the process of getting probate. So yes, it's usually read in the presence of family members, but it's in Ghana, it's usually done in courts. I, I believe that it was um, the, the, the law was couched in that way because of the confusion that sometimes comes when people um, die and the grabbing of property, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes. Uh, no, do you think do you think it's because of what we watch in the movies? You know, when the person's maybe says that, you know, I'm going to give this person this, give this person this, and then somebody, you watch in the movie, somebody goes and kills the person because they want their property or whatever it is. Is that why it's so different in, in, in Ghana? What, 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 for, I mean, the practice for most of us, that's what we learned, and that's what most of us do. When we prepare a will, we usually do three copies, okay. and we will process one and send it to the courts in the, to be sealed, and then um, get a receipt, we as lawyers would keep a copy and then we would give a copy to the one who made the will and advise the person as much as possible not to go and advertise it. You, you get it? Because sometimes people don't understand these things and when they, you know, so we just say you can give it a trusted person or keep it safely until uh, whatever. So usually when the person passes away, then we, I mean, if you happen to know that the lawyers who did it for the person um, can guide them to the courts you know, to make sure that this is done. So some people may have done it, left it with their pastors or whatever. They will, the pastors will have to send it to the high courts. You know, if you also live in a place where there's no high court registry, but you, you left it in that, maybe you, you live where there's a district court, it was kept in the registry. The law still says that when you pass away, the registrar will then have to send it to the high courts. You know, so the high court is the focus for the reading of wills. It's also the focus for applying for, for the probates, yeah. Okay. Can I can I appoint a guardian for my children in my will? You know, in children, first of all, children are not chattel, okay? Children are, you know, people who are supposed to be, they're human beings and there are rules and regulations that the state has concerning them. So there are some people in their wills, maybe they would say, um, I have this child who has this disability or this child has a risk this age, so I'd like this so-and-so to be a guardian. So that's an informal indication of who you would prefer 
to be a guardian. But to be a proper, lawfully appointed guardian, you'd have to go to the courts. You know, you'd have to go to the courts. There's a in the high court rules. There's a process by which you can apply to be the the the, the formal guardian ad litem for the person. So, in a will, yes, you can show your preference informally. The person can, you know, physically take start doing things. But if you want to do legal things, maybe go um, access some money is meant for the person or other, the, 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 the institution will demand to see an order from the courts. Because the, the court likes to protect children. So usually there's a process by which the, that person will then have to apply to the court to be appointed as the formal guardian at later. But there's nothing wrong if in the will there's an indication of who would like to um, prefer to, to do that for you. But then okay. um, they can do that in the family household is it just the father that should do the will or the mother has to do one how how is it supposed to work in a family setting ideally most people are supposed to to do their individual wills we encourage people to do their wills individually um if you own something jointly with a spouse for instance the law regards it as you you kind of um, there's a presumption of what we call tenants in common. That means everybody, if it's a house that you own jointly, it's in the name of Mr. and Mrs. Then physically, you own 50%. The other person also owns 50%. So in your will, you can pass on your interest in that property to whoever you want to give it to. Sometimes married people can agree amongst themselves that look, that particular property that we own together, all of us in our respective wills, give it to our, cho our, our, our children so that you give your half this one that's so. so they can collaborate in that kind of sense, but usually wills are done um, um, by individual people to okay. appoint your own executives, et cetera, yeah. Okay. Um, Emma, how many children can you insure under one education fund? You can insure as many children as you can, provided you are able to pay your premium. So if you have 10 children, so assuming I, I um, a man has about three wives with, I mean, 20 kids. Provided he can pay premiums, he can take insurance to cover all the kids. So once you're able to pay premiums, you can add as many children as you, you, you can. So yes, I mean, <laughs> I, I would wish you cover all your children because you can't cover some and leave some out. So if you have 20 children, you should be able to cover all 20. Okay, Emma, can I take a group cover? for my high school year group association. Okay. Yes, you can. So we have a group product or group solutions for associations and unions. So all you have to do is to come together and tell us, okay, we want this amount of money to be paid out when we lose a member of the group. They can even go to the extent of covering their parents. So group members covering their parents. So assuming we on the panel form a group, we can take insurance to cover ourselves and cover our spouses to the extent of even cover our parents and parents in this. So yes, we do have a policy that covers associations in unions. Okay, please Emma of Old Mutual, my question is, what is the maximum cover of your funeral policy and how fast do you pay claims? Okay, so currently we have 70,000 cities for retail. And when it comes to group, something like the unions and the associations, you can also decide to do more than the 70,000 cities. So one, when it comes to the second thing is how fast do we pay claims? Claim payment is within 48 hours. In fact, it's supposed to be 24 hours provided we receive all the documents. So once we receive the documents, you should expect your claim within 24 hours. Now, what actually delays the claim? I know where this person is coming from. <laughs> So people actually say insurance companies are do delay in paying claims. No, like Jackie said, you have no business as an insurer if you don't pay claims. That is why you are in business. So you pay claims. But the thing is, people end up submitting the right documentation. That's how come claims processing or payments claims. But once we get the full set of documents we had, come on, same day you will receive your your, your payment. Okay. Emma, can I buy insurance from a bank? Okay, so currently we have a bank assurance partnership with EcoBank, and we are also about to launch another partnership with Pan-African Savings and Loans. 
So yes, with all these banks that we, like I said earlier on during my presentation, sorry, my um, introduction, we have some kind of partnerships. So EcoBank is one. Whenever you move to any EcoBank branch, you can buy an insurance package. So we have um, something we call EcoRita. EcoRita covers, it has a risk component and an investment or savings component put together. So once you save towards your retirement, now when you pass on even before your retirement, you have a debt benefit that we pay, and then we pay the, the, the savings that you have done, plus um, an interest. We have the pure risk product as well. So yes, you walk into EcoBank branch, and then you'll be sorted out. Pan African will be done soon, and then when you walk in that bank, we have other partnership discussions that are ongoing, but I wouldn't like to mention them here. But then watch out in our space. Very soon you see a lot of partnership being launched. Fantastic. Um, uh, Sheila, you have a question here. Okay. It says, can you put your children's name on your property? If yes, can you still name that property in your will? Okay. The presumption, you know, if you buy property in the name of your children, then it is like a, you know, your, your brand is as a gift for them. Of course, if they are below the age of 18, then you hold it in trust for them and indicate when they will pass on to them. I mean, when they reach the age of majority, you pass it on to them. So once you have purchased that property in the name of a child, intending to give it to that child, then you can't give it to anybody else in your in your will. Okay, so ideally, it shouldn't be in the, because that means that in your lifetime, you've given it to that child as a gift. Okay, so there's no need for you to put it in your will anyone. Once it is a, a document, the, the document, the documentation relating to um, properties that are purchased or transferred to children, etc. It's also registered at Lands Commission. Then because so that if you do a search, you will see it in that child's name. So it's no more yours. So you can't give it to somebody else. Okay. All right. right. Thank you. Okay. Jackie, do you want to take this question that's on the screen? Who does not reside um, in Ghana but is a permanent resident um, in another country? Currently, our policy rules does not allow us to cover somebody who is permanently resident um, um, in, uh, in, in another country. However, if your mother was in Ghana and you bought the policy while she was in Ghana and she traveled and later became a permanent uh, resident, that does not cancel or void the policy. So let, 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 me, let, me, let me put that um, on record. So if at the time of buying the policy, your mother was in Ghana and, and you, covered, you covered her, and then probably she relocates and, and comes to live uh, with you in the US or in the UK or wherever you are, that doesn't void the policy so long as uh, premiums uh, uh, are being paid. But if um, um, from the start of the policy, she's, she's a permanent resident, a parent is permanently resident abroad, our product does not uh, um, give you scope um, to cover that person. Okay. Emma, how cheap is your funeral premium? Okay. So, like I said earlier on, you would have to determine the amount you want to buy. So, if you want to spend, or if you want your family to spend about 10,000 cities on your funeral, then that would also determine the amount you have to pay. If you want 50,000, and then a funeral part, the premium is actually dependent on the age of the person and the sum assured that the person is asking for. So if it's saying, um, I mean, how cheap is our, is our premium? Very, very cheap, depending on what you want. So we also look at these components to come up with the comfort. Very important. And then the sum assured or the amount that you're actually asking for. Okay, fantastic. What is the equivalent of the Akwantu Pub policy for those based in Ghana? Thank you, Denta. So um, for those based in Ghana, um, our flagship uh, product, what we call the unlimited um, funeral finance plan, is the equivalent of Akwantu Pub for those living um, in Ghana. And this is a product that is really, you can tailor make this product to suit what, uh, what your needs. The features on this product is that amazing, amazing features that any, anybody would want to have. You can have a live swap, similar as, as, as Emma was saying, you don't pay premium forever, you pay premium for a certain period. Post that, you can decide, you, you can get your, your premiums back or you can decide to um, 
let cover continue without you having to pay us um, any other premium very um, some assured so you decide how much you want and like and like am i saying it's a general principle you really in insurance where in life insurance in particular where premiums uh, is a function of the age uh, of the person being covered and then how much some assured um, you are looking for so in ghana if if you want uh, uh, the equivalent of our funeral policy um, that went to pay really is what we call the ffp uh, unlimited and let me say that for us as well the the, the sweetness of the cake really is in the fact that we allow you to transfer your funeral benefits to our transitions our funeral services so like i said you don't need to do the running around we have everything that can help you take care of, of the food that, that is the value and the advantage we bring um, um, to our customers. So whether it's, you need a coffin, a hair, you don't need to run a, around. Trust Enterprise Life to, to, to sort you out nicely on this one. So that's the equivalent of our enterprise, yeah. Fantastic. Can I buy a funeral cover with different insurers for the same person? Why would you want to do that? But anyway, I'll let them answer. <laughs> Well, yes. I mean, currently, that, that, there is no law that places a limit on the value. I, I mean, I, I remember uh, Emma talking about the the value. We have something we call the human life value. I mean, I, I can decide that. Look, my my value is twenty thousand, uh, or fifty, or hundred thousand. So it doesn't limit really uh, the number of life insurances you can have, so long as you have the capacity to pay the premium. But remember depending on, uh, on, on on the accumulations that happen, insurance companies can take a decision as to the extent to which they will, the, the, the extent of cover they, they really want to give you. So you can buy a policy with uh, with uh, Enterprise Life, you could buy a funeral policy with Old Mutual, you could buy a policy with Star, you could buy a policy with SIC. It's very, very, so long as you can pay uh, um, your premium. Uh, but the thing is, there's a catch, and the catch is affordability. Affordability will catch up with you. Because if you want to buy five separate funeral policies, remember you are paying premiums. And the big thing about getting value from your insurance policies is your ability to sustain premium payments. Because like I said, if you don't pay your premiums, that is where your policy then will go into a challenge situation and claims will not be paid out. So why do you want to spread your wings um, um, that far? You can do it, but you will be caught by the ability to pay uh, premiums because these things are not free. Absolutely. And I think I'm going to take just five more questions because people are now, I don't know where everybody, I don't know where they're, they're sleeping now. They've come and they're asking so many questions. Um, Sheila, you have a question on the screen. If you can answer that for us quickly and then we'll move on to the next one. I think a similar question came earlier. Um, mm. like I said, you know, depending on Ghana's bilateral, um, the nature of the, the relationship Ghana has with a particular country, you can have... Um, how should I put it? You can you can include properties in Ghana in your will, and once probate is granted, you can come and register it here and use and have it um, um, enforced or whatever followed up in here. That is, once you get the probate and can register it at our high court. But if Ghana doesn't have that bilateral relationship when it comes to contracts enforcement, etc., then as I said, you are advised to you know sort of separate have separate separate wills covering the property, those in Ghana and then those in that other country. So it's good to find out the nature of um, the relationship that country has with Ghana as far as enforcement of contracts, et cetera, is concerned before you you, you, you decide on what to do. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. I think with Gabriel, um, it's been, it's, they've answered this question quite a few times. Um, I guess it's more of documentation, you know, when you are coming to claim uh, for your, you know, for your insurance. Um, it's, it's, you know, how quickly you can get those documentation to them so that they can verify it, um, but they are fully prepared to handle large claims. Am I right, Emma, in right. saying that? Okay, fantastic. Um, Kwame says, may I know what happens when a property which has been willed to someone is sold before the will is read? Sheila. Okay, the key question is whether the property was sold before the person died, okay? 
a will, well, in, in law, we use a word, we call it, we said a, a will is ambulatory. That is, it only takes effect when the person dies, okay? So a person, that's their will in their 20s. They have one house. I mean, they, they, they have a couple of houses, etc. Then they indicate who they want to share it to. Somewhere along the line, things get difficult. They sell some. So by the time that they die, a particular property that they mentioned in their will is supposed to go to A, has been sold by the person before he dies. Then it's not there. Because the will only takes effect from the time the person dies. That's the key. So the quite I mean, it, it's if the property is still there, you get it. If it's not there, you don't get it. Okay. So it's not about a matter of when it is read. The law says that as soon as a person dies, nobody can deal with that person's property unless you go to court to go and get either probate or lesser administration, depending on how the person dies. If you deal with and if you try to sell anybody's property as soon as the person dies. If the property, you know, was still in that person's name, it hasn't been sold, you will be regarded as intermeddling in the property. And that's it's a quasi crime. They can take you to court and charge you, you know, you can be fined, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the question is whether at the time the person died, a particular property that they said they'll give to you is still there. He hasn't sold it. If he sold it, it's too bad for you. If it is still mm -hmm. there, then you can get it. But if he sold it, yeah. But if somebody after he died, somebody tried to sold it before they went to go, they went for probate, then there's a problem. Yeah. But I think the real meaning of the question is if the property is not there anymore, then what happens? Then it is the state. When it comes to administration yeah. of this, there's even another issue. Um the, the personal representatives, whether it's an administrator or a, or an executor, their first responsibility is to pay the debts of the deceased person. So in paying the debts, if the chattels are not able to pay the debt and they have to sell some property, they, they will have to sell one of the properties, even if it's been assigned to someone. So it's only after they finish paying the person's debts and properties are still there that they will look at who particular property is supposed to go to. So the fact that somebody's giving you something doesn't mean, you know, automatically you you, you, you get to see, you have to be sure that the person doesn't have some big bank debts, et cetera, et cetera, that will swallow part of the property before it. So it's the residue. Okay, thank you so much. And somebody said to um, there was a question for you, Emma, that they don't see you guys advertising your insurance. They don't see enough of old mutual around. Okay, so we do more of radio, and then we do uh, print as well. But then I think if we have in plan, if we have in store things that you're going to roll out, so very soon you see a lot of our pull-ups, our banners, and um, our banners all over, our posters all over. And there will be more on radio as well. I think currently we're on City FM, and um, I think last month we were on Joy FM as well. But it's like I said earlier on, we are coming out big with a lot of partnerships, and a lot of noise will be made. So, they should, I mean, tune into their radio sets. They, they should listen to Peace FM, Joy FM, City FM, who will be live on starting from, I mean, next two months. Okay, fantastic. It has been a very insightful, educating um, show this evening. I've learned so much um, and um, I'm sure that my audience has learned a lot as well. So now I'm just going to ask you your last few words. Um, I know you've mentioned it, but I really want you to emphasize, um, I'll go with you, Sheila, first, the importance of getting a will um, you know, for people in our community, you know, how important, really, really, I just want you to emphasize the importance of us getting wills right now. Okay. Thank you very much. I would encourage everybody to have a will because whatever assets that you had, you sweat and sweated for it. So it will be good if you determine what happens to it once you leave this end. Making a will is not that's expensive. I would encourage you to see a lawyer to help you so that whatever will that you do also stands the test of time. It's very, very important. Um, yes, so I, I, I'm hoping that it doesn't matter your age, just do a will. The fact that you do a will doesn't mean you're going to die tomorrow. And then my will, um, long ago, almost 30, about 30, over 30 years ago, by God's grace, I'm still here. So doing a will, it's like you've arranged things before you go.
God calls you. So please, I will encourage you all to make a will. Thank you so much. Because I'm sure you've seen so many issues that have come up with family disputes and all of these things that, you know, you wouldn't want any family to go through this. Yes, it brings peace. It brings peace after you die because everybody knows, oh, you don't want to scramble after you've passed away. And then the scramble usually, the ones they target most are the ones who are closest to you. That is your surviving spouse, your children, etc. Especially when your children are young. Please, nobody knows tomorrow. So make adequate provision for them. I know insurance is there. It gives you a certain cover. But then as far as the things that you have that are concerned, you know, your money, your accounts, etc. Do a will. Make sure that it's particularly to those who are very dependent on you. Because you don't want to leave this world suddenly when you have not protected their rights to your assets, so which can help them to sustain themselves. So please, please make a will, especially when your children are young. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila, for joining us for two hours and 15 minutes of your precious time. Um, if we were paying for consultancy, we would have paid a lot of money for this. So I really, know. really appreciate your time. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you too. I really, for really appreciate your time. Um, and I have Thank left, you. I have left um, 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 Sheila's details um, on the screens as well. I will definitely be posting and sharing out to everybody. So thank you again, Sheila, for joining us on the show. I'm going to go and take you off now so you can go and rest um, for the rest thank of the you. evening. Thank you. Okay, Emma, your last few words to encourage, you know, people who are watching this evening on the importance of getting life insurance, health insurance, you know, um, to cover ourselves, you know, how important really is it to have um, cover for your loved ones and for yourself? Okay, so my last words for our cherished viewers is we need to buy insurance. In fact, our lives depend on this insurance. People have made fortune out of insurance. People's destinies have changed because of insurance. People have become billionaires overnight because of insurance. Please, we need insurance more than any other country. We are seen as in developing country. Yes, we are, but how can we get there? We can get there when we also do what the developed countries are doing. We do understand insurance. We have taken insurance. The economy is booming. We need to do things. I'm encouraging everybody to secure their kids' future, to secure their own future with insurance. Whether it be in health insurance or life insurance, you need insurance in place. You need some form of insurance in place. So my fellow Ghanaians, please try and get an insurance. It's a must. You need insurance. And on the travel, you need insurance as well on the travel. Whatever trip you take, you need travel insurance. Old Mutual has a local travel insurance. So whether you're traveling abroad or locally, you can still buy a travel insurance. You need insurance. I will still keep emphasizing on that. Insurance gives us hope. It's more or less like giving your kids hope in your absence. Let's give our kids hope now. Let's get insurance for our employees so they give us their optimal test. We need insurance. And once again, we need insurance. Thank you very much, Dinta, for, your, for giving me the opportunity. Thank you so much to Emma for joining us on the show. It's been amazing to have you um, on the panel. Um, and, you know, again, guys, I've shared um, Emma's details. Um, I will keep sharing it again um, once the show is over. So if you do want to contact them, you can do so. Um, so thank you so much, Emma. And I'll now go over to, to my Jackie. Jackie, thank you so much um, you. for your time, um, for being on the show. Your last words of, you know, really encouraging, one, the diasporans, people who are in the diaspora who are thinking of insuring their loved ones and also just really emphasizing again on the importance of life insurance and insurance in general. 
Um, thank you very much for, for the opportunity. It's been amazing and, and I have I have enjoyed, especially the, the bit about having wills. I mean, something we never think about, you know. You know, we always think that there's more time to do that. So thank you for this for this wonderful um, and, and program. There's something I always say, Denta. Life insurance is what everybody needs, but nobody wants. Why? Because we always think that the mention of insurance connotes evil. It always drives and carries home a fear factor. But the question is, do you need life insurance? I want to ask you also, do you have anybody depending on you financially? If the answer is yes, then you don't have a choice but to have life insurance. Because like I said earlier on, life insurance is just an instrument or a tool that allows you to secure the financial well-being of your family, financial security for your family, just to ensure that their destinies, whether it's today or it's tomorrow, is preserved. As a parent, your dream is to ensure that you give the kids, your, your children, the best of life. Indeed, we want them to be better than ourselves. But in the course of that journey, who knows? Mishaps happen. Who thought that we'll wake up one night and COVID will rear up its ugly head? Here we are today. Families that some children who yeah. will remain on the street or who will find themselves on the street because there was no life insurance. There's a boy out there who passionately wanted to be a pilot. That vision is gone forever. So I want to ask or tell our, our cherished listeners or viewers, in your absence, your family must still live as if you were present. In your absence, the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations of your children must still be fulfilled. In your absence, your children must look on the wall, look at your picture and say, mommy, daddy, thank you for giving us that legacy. It's not about being quick to take your money and, not, and being slow to pay. Like I said, at Enterprise Life, for us, our philosophy is to look for a reason to pay the claim than to repudiate. Otherwise, what business do we have in saying we want to give all who come into contact with us their desired advantage because we are the best at what we do? Life insurance is a necessity. You must get one. You must own one if you want your family to preserve. For us, we are just a website away. Let me make it even sweeter. All you have to do is to just download the Enterprise Advantage app. You can get it on Google Play Store. Bingo, you are there. Or it's just a star 713555. You can get, get a policy and your life is secured and that of your, your families. Trust me, we will pay your claims 24 hours if only we can get all the documents that we require on time. Be covered for life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Jackie. And uh, we have the details on the screen. We have the number. We have the app details. You can go online and you can, you know, download the app as well for, for more information on Enterprise Life. Um, I've learned so much today. I can't thank you enough, um, Jackie. It's been an interview um, overdue, but I'm so glad we were able to have this conversation this you know, it's an important topic and um, things that, you know, we don't like to discuss, but needs to be discussed. Um, and like you said, you know, there's a boy walking out there that his dreams has been shattered because maybe their parents didn't do a life insurance. And so thank you so much for emphasis, for your emphasis on that, because I think it's really important. Thank you once again for joining me on The Dentist Show. To my viewers, what can I say? Another great episode of The Dentist Show Live. It has been absolutely amazing. Again, you can go to aquantumpa.com for those of you living in a diaspora who really want to get insurance for your family members who are living in, um, in Ghana. You can do that. You can also insure yourself when you travel to Ghana as well. So I think it's important that you go online and register. I want to say a big thank you to um, our sponsor, World Remit, um, for coming on board and supporting um, this amazing conversations that we've been having. You can join the 
2.7 million customers worldwide using World Remit to send money to your family and friends back home. They are fast, they are efficient, um, and you can send your money in minutes. Um, so make sure that you know you go on World Remit and you know download the app or transfer online. It's totally up to you um, which way you want to do it. But thank you so much for World Remit for sponsoring the show. Again, I want to say a big thank you to um, SMB. Um, she has these amazing um, balloons. Um, that you can get, you know, for your birthdays, for your christening. She has an events company um, that you can um, basically get these, you know, designs um, really nicely done. Um, you can go on her social media, her Instagram is SMB events underscore, or you can email her. Um, she organizes baby showers, christenings, birthday parties, does his amazing creative balloons as well. Make sure that you go online and, you know, get that for a loved one, especially during COVID. Somebody would love and appreciate a little balloon to be delivered to them at home. And now that we are gradually opening up, if you are trying to organize an event and you're struggling to do so, um, please contact Sabrina um, and she will be able to help you with that. Again, thank you to um, Seek for this amazing headphones, which I do have one here. I'll show you in a second. Um, you can purchase that online. Um, they are amazing. Look, doesn't look good. When you put it on, it lights up blue. You've also got a microphone to go with it. Um, and it's just an amazing product to have. Um, it's like this. You know, you put it on and you can get talking. Again, if you do go online um, to www.seekvr.com, um, you can get 10% off. Yes, 10% off of all her products that she has, all the different ranges that she has. You can go online and um, get one as well. So, again, big thank you to everybody who continues to watch our show and listen to us each and every week. If you are interested in investing in Ghana, in Africa, make sure that you go to Odana Connect. It's the website that you can go on for job opportunities, for information about, you know, partnerships in agriculture and different businesses. There's, you know, loads of people out there that are looking for partnerships. And um, make sure that you take advantage of that. I'm going to put the website on your comments page right now. Make sure that you click on Odana Network um, and get subscribing. It's the time for you to subscribe and make sure that you get connected. Um, thank you to everybody, Jacob, who's watching, um, Sama, Brew, Atta. Thank you so much for, for you all for watching the show. Make sure that you keep sharing your pages. We want to make sure that people are really getting all of this great information that we are putting out there in our community. Um, again, to Prodigy, Foods, Cassie's Classics, she makes these amazing um all-purpose seasoning, jollof, shito, all of that. Go online and make sure that you purchase one. Again, I want to say a big thank you to my team who are behind the scenes of The Dentist Show Live. Chrissy, um, Pearl, Naomi, and Cassandra, thank you all for being part of this amazing journey when it comes to The Dentist Show Live. Um, we also want to hear from you what topics you want us to discuss. Um, please put it on the comments page. We really want to know what conversations that you want me to have with people. Um, we want to look at fibroid. Um, one of these days talk about fibroid is why I think a lot of women in our community are getting that. Um, we want to talk about, you know, different health issues. Um, do, you want, do you want us to discuss mental health? What topics would you like for us to discuss in the coming weeks? Um, we are looking forward to hearing from you as well. Again, thank you all for watching the show. I really appreciate every single one of you who makes the time to tune in to watch The Dentist Show live. And to all the sponsors, Well Dream It, um, Cassie's Classics, Vesta London Beauty as well for the amazing lip glosses. You can go on their website and also purchase that as well. But to all the amazing team that I have, thank you all so much. Again, good night, God bless, and I will see you on Sunday with a topic that would be very, very interesting. Take care. Good night. God bless. Bye-bye.